All right, everybody. Today is 9-16. Follow now. Wait, can you mute your mic when you're not on? Thank you, sir. Um, today is 2-17-2021. We got an all-right-wing panel today. Um, first thing, I guess uh, we're going to go around and let everybody introduce themselves. And with that, I would like to hear everybody's opinion um, when it comes to right-wing politics or who you think you should be voting for. Will you be sticking with Trump? Uh, will you be sticking with the GOP? Are you moving more libertarian? Are you just kind of <laughs> waiting for the Republicans to get their stuff together and in the meantime voting for Democrats? Um, so, Kay, we will start with you. Well, um, for those of you who don't know, I am a uh, right-leaning libertarian. Uh, I just don't really have a whole lot of faith in the two-party system. Um, this past election, I voted straight third party. Um, I don't see that changing very much in the near future. I think that politics is just going to get more divisive, and I'm going to continue to lose faith in the two-party system. So I will probably continue to vote third party as much as it drives Tom crazy. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and do you have anything to, uh, shill? Shill? Yeah, you got a Twitter or you got Um, a... you guys should definitely like, share, subscribe, follow, uh, Tom Fullery because that's where I am most active, <laughs> um, as far as streaming goes. And you guys can follow me on my Twitter. It's at Kfellows with a Z. Awesome. All right. Uh, Fallen Hour. Hey, everybody. Um, Felinor. Um, I mostly do finance and wealth management. Um, yeah, I don't really shield that much of anything. Um, I don't know. Like, things have been crazy the past couple of months slash years. Sounds I don't, crazy I don't really, there. Yeah, my son. He, yeah. he shrieks about as much as the Liberal Party does. Um, oh. savage. Well done. But yeah, um... I don't know, man. I, I voted Trump. I What's voted Trump it? this election because the past election, I didn't vote for Trump. Uh, but this election, they gave me bad choices to pick from. I don't like anybody who raises my taxes. Um, I'm probably going to end up creating my own political party or just building a political party for capitalists. Uh, I think we're pretty much cashing out and blowing down in regards to U.S. politics. And we're just going to form our own collective and just do our own thing. Just rebuild the aristocracy that's secretly been running the entire time. So, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. I appreciate you joining. Uh, Redneck, make sure uh, you unmute yourself this time. There you go. Well, thank you, Pro Streamer. I yes, appreciate sir. that. Thank you. I'm here for and you. And actually, you helped me because I my, my menu keeps you know hiding it because I have it in full screen for you. So I want everybody to see you guys real well. Gotcha. What's up, everybody? My name is Redneck. That's R-E-D-N-E-Q. Uh, I'm a redneck with quality. Just telling you. Um, yeah, I'm considered one of the most toxic people on the internet nowadays. Um <gasps> I believe I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist. Um, I'm not educated. I came right out of high school, went right in the military, was became a service connected disabled veteran at 19, serving during the first Gulf. Um, life has not been easy. I don't believe in uh, universal welfare, healthcare, and any of this other stuff, unless you could prove to me that they can fix it. Because I've lived in it for 30 years, and it ain't shit. That's it. Cool. Appreciate you coming on. Um... And over in the private chat, if any of you guys, the chat's asking for links. So if you guys want to put those in the private chat, I'll uh, post them on all the platforms for you. Uh, Rob, appreciate you joining us. So shout yourself out and uh, let us know how you think voting should go for right now. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, nice to meet everyone. I think it's the first time on the panel with all of you. My name's Rob Knorr. I have a channel called Normal America with Rob Knorr. It's a play on my last name, you see, Knorr. Uh, I'm on Twitch, I'm on DLive, I'm on YouTube. You can find me if you just search Normal America with Rob Noor, it'll come up on all of those places. Also have channels on Gab, Odyssey, Rumble, things like that, that I'm just starting to use a little more. But for live streaming, I prefer Twitch. I would, labels are hard. I guess I would call myself a conservative populist in a nutshell. I feel the two party system has thrown us overboard. All of us on the left, right, white, black, Muslim, Christian, pagan, atheist, it doesn't matter. Uh, the establishment, the party of Mitch McConnell is basically the same 
ruling party is the party of Chuck Schumer, and it's all about consolidating power and pretending that they are enemies when in reality they're just screwing over the average person. Uh, they want to usher in a globalism and a neo-feudalist system, and the best way to do that is to wipe out the middle and working class in this country. And so all of their policies regarding climate change, COVID, um, all of the other things that they're doing is designed to do that. It's all reliant on the government and not self-sufficient. That's why I believe that populists on the left and the right should actually work together to end this corrupt system. So because of my beliefs in that, um, you know, I think that the Democrat Party is so bad because even though I do believe it's more of the establishment versus the rest of us versus Republican versus Democrat, the Democratic Party is the face of that corruption because they realized that they could use the progressive cause in order to drive a wedge and to obtain more power, uh, take away our First Amendment rights, our Second Amendment rights, like you've heard other streamers talking about. Um, so that's why I would say that primary those losers, the rhinos in the Republican Party. I ran for Congress myself in a special election in 2019. Maybe I'll do so again, or maybe I'll just push for people. Uh, if you're out there, local elections are important. Please get involved in politics. If you care about your people, uh, you're already better than 95% of everyone that's in elected bodies. So run for Congress, run for school board, run for local elections, uh, and that's going to be the way that we start to fight back. But the most important thing is to win the culture war and get back into culture, because politics is downstream of culture, and as long as the establishment left controls academia, the entertainment industry, mainstream media, Silicon Valley, etc., they're going to keep becoming more and more authoritarian. So check me out at Normal America with Rob Norm. Awesome, man. Appreciate it. And, uh, and why are the rest of us here? Holy shit, he's pro. <laughs> like, sorry, Rob, don't mean to bring you down. <laughs> no, not at all. He, he, he just <laughs> muted and unmuted his mic three times, too. Like, he's he's doing it big. Uh, Phil KOE, appreciate you joining us today, man. What you got for us? Well, folks, welcome one and all. I am thrilled to be here for this very special panel here at the Tom Foolery Show. Be sure to like, share, subscribe right here, or follow him in whatever way you can on whatever platform you are on. Come on, folks. Every minute, every day, every second you don't, you're leaving money on the table. But while we're on that subject, I am the devilishly handsome outlaw himself, your king of extreme, Phil KOE. You can find me over at KOE Nation on YouTube for all kinds of fun, frivolity, and KOE content. I do everything from alcohol reviews, poetry readings, uh, keeping you up on the updates and the things you need to know from day to day. I also make guest star appearances on the Dog and Chicken Show, Dads Worldwide, right here on the Tom Foolery Show as well. In terms of my beliefs, I am a person that believes that you should be as uninterrupted and un as little interference from the government in your day-to-day -day life as could ever be possible. And if you read the news and the legislation coming out even badly, you know that the time in your day where you have no business with the state becomes less and less and less and less and less. And so that is something that I will do all I can with every word I speak and every bit of will within my body to oppose. And that is why in terms of what you think we should do for our elections going forward. That is why I have decided to do the greatest thing I could possibly do to try and help set this country forward and try and set it straight. In the year 2024, I have announced my candidacy for the presidency of the United States of America. In 2024, do the right thing. Vote extreme. I'd vote for Phil. There you go. And, and, and did, did you uh, also include, uh, you know, the, oh, oh, I guess like the, the direction you would be voting is for yourself. So, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, as should all of you. I mean, come sure. on. Like in the 2024, do the right thing. Vote extreme. Phil yeah, does anybody want to change their answer? <laughs> or <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to vote I'll, for the Phil party. Okay. Uh, all right. And then uh, last but not least, we got Brento Box on here. Appreciate you joining us, man. Yeah, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. Uh, yeah, so what was the question again? The question was, what, what's the future for conservatives or Republicans? What am I going to do? How am I going to vote? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think of conservatism as sort of like a, as sort of just like a preservation of uh, what you think is important or what, what values are important. Um, so I, 
I only vote conservative or Republican if I feel like, you know, I'm opposed to what the Democrats are doing or what the left is doing. And uh, wherever I see, wherever, whatever party I see is being the most authoritarian or, you know, uh, maybe like opposing free speech the most or wanting to, you know, uh, create censorship laws or things like that. Or if they want to create, you know, huge government structures to do things that I think uh, the government shouldn't be responsible for, like, you know, control the market or things like that. Uh, then I just start going, okay, I'm just not going to vote for those people anymore. I'll vote for these people over here. Uh, so as long as, uh, as long as the conservatives and the Republicans are, are the more moderate people, uh, you know, as long as I see them as, uh, standing for what's less extreme, uh, then I would probably all be supporting them over, over the Democrats. Uh, I mean, I don't think, God, I don't think Trump's going to run in 2024. Uh, you know, I don't know whether, uh, Ivanka is going to run or something like that, but, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, I don't. I think the. I think Trumpism, would it? You know, the uh, the MAGA the MAGA movement will probably continue. I think Trump is probably going to be out, although he'll probably support someone. Um, but yeah, I mean that's ultimately uh, just paying attention to politics and and voting for the less extreme person or the less extreme party. I think is uh, is my ultimate my ultimate goal, my ultimate value, <laughs> and uh, that's what I would call being conservative. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, this is an open conversation, so you guys can all jump in as you want. If you don't want to interrupt or uh, are trying to get in, um, just raise your hand, and I'll make sure you get called on. Um, Redneck, you look like you are. I thought that was. I thought that was an. Yeah, I thought that was an intro, and I was like, well, shit. Everybody else telling me like how they they said how they want to vote or what they want to vote about, and I'm I'm just thinking. I mean, that's a little bit bigger of a conversation we need to have, right? I mean, all of us. We, I think before we started the stream, we all talked about how there are different levels of conservatism. And I think the biggest thing that people don't realize on the right, or at least the perception is on the right, we're just a bunch of boxed in nerds or, you know, freak shows, Bible thumping. No, you know, it's all about morality and your morality. I mean, no, we're not firebrands. We're not fucking Bible bumper. Sorry again for cussing. I cuss a lot. I'm, I'm ex-military. Sorry. But I mean, it's, it's to me, we have a diverse as just a, a diverse tent as the left does if not even more in my opinion, because I actually think conservatives are actually the non-racist, non-ID politics. We don't like ID politics because we know what that means. You're just boxing each other in these little sellable capsules that you could use and pluck to put wherever you need to for any of your political purposes. And I just don't buy into that system. I hate that system. And I think the reason I, you know, I, I call myself a conservative. I started politically streaming literally a year ago. Um, under COVID, I started streaming and I was brought right into the politics world. And I just figured, well, hell, I'm an older guy. I'm getting ready to turn 50. Um, I want to make sure that I understand my kids' generations and what they're going to deal with. I want to be able to relate. And honestly, I can't. My kids can't even relate with their own age groups, the 30s, the 20s. Like they're like, dad, these people, they're nuts advocating for socialism, believing the government's going to take care of you no matter what, believing we should have somebody take care of us for everything and not have any self responsibility or even just suffer. You have to suffer to learn how to, to get through this big mess called the government. You have to. They, they, the government don't like any of us. So those of us on the right, I just want to say that I, I'm, I'm very liberal when it comes to a lot of social issues. Very liberal. You know, drugs. Um, uh, well, drugs is the biggest one. I just don't believe the drugs and marriage. I don't believe the government should be involved in any of the, either one of those things. Like anything with your body or you choose to do with somebody else, as long as y'all both agree, none of the government's business. And I think our tent could cover everything from that to hardcore conservative rhinos. I mean, that just believe in straight up, you know, the Bible for what it's written. I, I just, I'm just frustrated. I guess I'm just frustrated. Maybe like Rob said too, it's, 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 it's getting the younger generations to look and see what the hell's going on. Cause I don't think you guys realize that you're selling yourselves out. And I've said this already and I've said it every day since um, the whole New York times article came out where they publicly acknowledged what they did and how they did it. Demo anybody that voted democratic is a bootlicker yeah like i agree with a lot of what you're saying uh, also like we talked before the show we were talking about the definition of conservatism it's tough and labels are stupid but they're necessary at the same time um but liberalism can you be a right-wing liberal well yeah like I, it used to be liberalism stood for things like free speech 
I'm a, I'm a free speech absolutist, basically. So what happened to the yeah. left? They used to claim to be liberal. Now they're the party of the illiberal. Uh, they claim to be the party of diversity, but they're not. They're the party of superficial diversity. The only diversity that matters is the diversity of thought. Now, you might get to that diversity through a bunch of superficial characteristics. For example, if I am of a certain race and I, if I was born in Africa and I happen to be black, my lived experience will be different than someone who's born in Boston and would be white. But that doesn't mean that necessarily they'll have diverse opinions. And it's those diverse opinions we should be reaching for. Instead, the left has played the game of identity politics where they're not actually concerned about diverse opinions. They're just concerned about superficial diversity. But that superficial diversity only matters if everyone shares the same opinion. So they punish anyone. That's why you see someone like Candace Owens that's gone after harder than anyone like I will ever be because she disproves their entire argument that, oh, if you're black and you're a woman, then you have to embrace this idea. Ideology. Well, no, uh, we judge people based on the content of their character, not on the color of their skin. I believe a famous man once said that that was the way to go. But sadly, the Democratic Party and the left of today has totally thrown that idea overboard. They're only concerned about your superficial characteristics. And the last thing I'll say here that I think you were alluding to, Redneck, that's a good point. We should be the big tent party. Look, I'm for people that disagree with me. I think that we should allow everyone, even if you have, if we're all honest, none of us will ever find someone who totally agrees with us on anything, which means we'll never find a political party that we totally agree with. Right? It's just not going to happen. If you're a free thinker, it won't happen. So what we need to be doing as conservatives is reaching out to communities that traditionally haven't been conservative, such as inner city black communities, single women, young people. There are so many cases we could make as to why conservatism is the right way to go. For example, one of the things I, when I was running for office, reaching out for young people, I said was this. I'm 36. I did a lot of stupid stuff. I still do a lot of stupid stuff. I certainly did a lot of stupid stuff when I was young. Do I want to know that 20 years from now, if I get a good job, that someone could dig up a tweet I made when I was in high school and ruin my life? That's not us. That's not what we do. That's what the humorless losers on the left that want to divide us do. So if we want to reach young people, we start to tell them, we're the people that have fun. We're the people that say you could be yourself. If we want to reach inner city black people, we say, we don't treat you as an inner city black person. We're just going to treat you like a person, like an adult. And if you disagree with us, that's fine too. But we're not going to patronize you. We're not going to pretend that we're superior to you and we know what's best for you and you need to be treated like a child. So I think this idea of being a big tent party, I think you're absolutely right, Redneck. That's where we need to put this focus and try to get rid of the toxicity that is identity politics that's running rampant in the left right now. So Nailed what, it. Yeah. What, would you, yeah. I, what would you call identity politics then? Because I, I think the right does a lot of identity politics as well. Um, we all, I mean, we all do it, but do we, do we base our, all right, let me back up. I think one of the most offensive things I, I'm anecdotal Andy, right? Everybody calls me anecdotal Andy because all they do is speak from personal experience. But what they fail to realize is I tell them that everybody does it too. Everybody makes decisions off your own lived experience. Just like Rob said, I could be from Africa. You wouldn't know that because I'm bald and white. I, I worked with a guy that was from Africa that was bald and white. I was like, holy shit, you're from Africa. Because he called himself an African and I thought he was being racist. Like that was what my mind told me, right? You got to be from Africa to be black. That's what our brains have told us. At least that's what society tells you. That's where true foundational black Americans say Africa, Africa, Africa. There's more than black people that come out of Africa. The fact that we focus so much on a skin color and, and create an identity or create politics around that skin color is what is to me the racism that still exists today and is being perpetuated. It's slavery. It is in cap, it's, it's in cap, not only is it harming those of color saying your color is making you lesser than, and you have, it, it's continually against you. But then they turn around and say, because your color, you're not able to come out of it either. And I think that that is a dis, it's disingenuous to tell somebody they can't do something because of the way they look, the, the physical size of their body, the way that you perceive that. They, I mean, we have people with no arms and legs that could do more shit than I can. I'm just saying, people, we, we're sitting here living in identity politics is when you use those things to bend everybody else around you to make it good for you. And and so back to my aunt old Andy, I piss off liberals because I'm able to check every one of their boxes that they use today to go out and try to get special treatment for themselves. And then I try to show them the special treatment that the government currently offers for these situations. Nobody cares. No. So that's identity politics. 
And um, like real quick, I'll just say the and going along with that is I talked about the diversity that matters being diversity of thought. Of course, there will be identity politics when it comes to thought. People that have similar thoughts will tend to group together and push for that ideology. That could be considered a form of identity politics. Of course, I'm hypocritical as well. We all do identity politics to some level. I primarily am concerned with rural America, which I think people of all skin colors, of all religions, of all backgrounds in rural America have been screwed over royally and the diff so of many other populations but the difference is i don't really see a voice i don't see hollywood speaking up for rural america i don't see any politician doing it i don't see jeff zuckerberg doing it i don't see you know any of these people bill gates any of the people that control this narrative no one speaks up instead they're told it's flyover country you have privilege you know people that have been struggling for 50 years watching their communities go down the toilet and not only that they have to suffer the indignity of being told shut up and be happy about it you still have privilege as your life's collapsing that's who i speak up for so i don't mind people that speak up for certain communities when i'm talking about the toxicity of identity politics is only viewing people as immutable characteristics so not even viewing them as what their ideas are but saying oh you're black therefore you're black and that's the group we put you into and the Democrats have weaponized this in a form of cultural Marxism, where I'm no longer Rob Nor. I'm not an individual that has unique thoughts and opinions. I just am a bunch of checkboxes like Redneck saying, I'm white, I'm male, I'm straight, I'm married, I'm Christian, but I'm fat. And so if I want those victim points, well, then I just focus on that one area that they deem oppressor. And that's the coalition that we've seen the Democratic Party build. It's not about good ideas. Yep. It's about how can I call myself a victim and then lump myself in with all other victims? By the way, that's why they hate Donald Trump so much, because he is the avatar of everything they hate. He's wealthy, white, straight. He just he checks every box even more than we do here. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what I'm talking about specifically when I talk about identity politics. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I guess uh, you guys you guys have said it a lot about like what identity politics about what identity politics is. It's sort of like reducing people to to immutable characteristics or locking them in boxes, right? I, I think it's kind of like trying to shape the world or politics. Like ideally, right? People will say like this is impossible, and it's kind of true. But everyone should be equal before the law which means mm -hmm. that politics should be based on equality and, you know, seek to preserve justice or equality. But then when you base your politics or you try to enforce politics based on different, you know, characteristics because you see an imbalance or an injustice in the world and you start making unequal laws that apply to certain people in certain ways based on their characteristics and how you view the world and what you think they need, you, you inevitably will end up making unjust laws. And they're going to create more injustice in the system. Now, a lot of people will be like, well, it's corrective, right? It's positive discrimination. Like an injustice was done. So now this, this law is in place to correct it. But, you know, eventually you're going to have to take that out. Or there's going to be another group. Or there's going to be another group. There's, there's an infinite number of groups. And everybody can claim some kind of disadvantage. And then they want a special law to, uh, you know, to address their specific disadvantage in this place or in this time or because of this. And so it's like, it's fractured. Identity politics creates fractured politics and like a, basically a more unjust society by definition. It's impossible to have a, a truly equal or a truly just society when you're, when you're basing laws around people's, you know, their, their race, their, their gender, their sex, their, their every, you know, different one, every category. But what if it's past like, uh, laws also hurt those people based on those same immutable characteristics? Wouldn't we want to make new laws to fix that for the future? We've been trying, Tom, but the Democrats no. keep blocking it. I, well, I don't the disagree first place. with that. My point sure, is, sure, is sure. that when we just say don't make <laughs> laws that based on immutable characteristics, I'm saying like – we probably should make laws based on those things, especially if past laws based on those things hurt them. Then we would like to make future laws to help them with whoa, that whoa, whoa, in the whoa. future. No, no, Wait, no, Tom, no. Tom, that, give me one example. One example of a law that you could, you could make on an immutable characteristic that would work. I mean, can you – do you remember uh, – damn it, I'm blanking on the word uh, – uh, reparations? Is that what no, you're talking about? No, I'm thinking, oh, you're saying like something for the future. Right. Oh, like like uh, helping inner city kids get into colleges. Like, uh, uh, you know. Um, Are all inner city kids of one color? Exactly. No, black inner city kids. Sorry. 
Uh, okay, but listen. Uh, why? Don't, what about here. the white inner city kid? What about the right, Hispanic and, and, inner city kid? If they I weren't, talk, so they weren't hurt based on laws in the past or based okay. on discrimination based on their skin color, right? Like, Rob, can I can anyway. I can I handle this one real quick? Just okay, sure. Tom. Yes, so, affirmative action. Thank you, Flicker. Yeah, affirmative since action. Is, go ahead, Redneck. Since 1964, what have we seen happen since the Civil Rights Act had passed? We've seen large influxes inside of inner cities, ghettos created, large welfare states, and even in rural America, you got your Appalachians, your hillbillies, your hicks, your rednecks like me. It's it not only happened, it not only affected the big cities, it also affected rural America and right. everything else. It's it's all the same. So these laws that were oppressive back in the day, it went from being based off of a color to based off of a culture. The government created a culture of poor. And nowadays, I mean, since the 60s, it literally exacerbated who all fell into that trap. Of course, it had grabbed a majority of the black and Hispanic population at that time because it, it told them, hey, move it to move to the big cities. We'll incentivize. We're going to help you out. And then they dropped them. They dropped them like just we don't care. So now we have all these laws that are in the books that aren't even followed. Courts don't even uphold them. And you want to talk about adding more laws to the books. I'm actually in the reverse. I think we should actually take a hard look at it, and we should all push, like Rob said, we should all literally try as much as we can at the local level to reclaim our government with common sense people. It doesn't have to be Democrat or Republican. I don't care what party they're with, as long as they're common sense and they all agree with an America first agenda of cleaning up our problems, cleaning the roles, getting rid of race inside of politics, I mean, inside of all of these procedural uh or these processes to help one way over the other, because inherently you're going to have, if you help one person over the other because of their skin color or because they're not of, because of no skin color or because of no hair, like the, we've lived this, we've lived it now for over 60 years. We're at 60 years now since the, the civil rights act has passed almost 60 years and it's got nothing but worse. I'm almost 50 people. So I can promise you this hasn't gotten better. When I was a kid, racism was not as strong as it is now. I'm sorry. It wasn't as violent. I, I, you're making it sound like the black people were only hurt just based on class. And I would say that they were hurt. And, and we can blame it on the Democrats. We can blame it on welfare. We can blame it on all of these other things. We can fix those things. I'm just saying that, like, they weren't. The it wasn't just class if alone. They were discriminated against based on skin we're, color. Sure, but and Tom, and we all, it, Tom, we all are conservatives here. In the meantime, Tom, yeah. we're all conservatives <laughs> here. And do you understand that the conservative party, i.e. the Republican party, was started by black and white abolitionists? Yeah, we, I'm not. The, 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 the black America was, was doing well through I, the I 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. They I were agree. accelerating. Fixing welfare is one of my biggest issues, like for okay. sure. Okay. Like these Can are, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so here's the deal. Certainly, you would be a fool and a liar to not say that there were racist policies in this country that were targeted against specific right. races. Like, like none of us would right. say that. I'm not saying like, that. That's right. I'm not true. saying it. The point is, anytime the government gets involved in policy specifically targeted to race, whether it be to help them or to harm them, it is disastrous. We now see in California that they're actually, the Democrats there are trying to repeal the law that says that the government's not allowed to discriminate or prefer people based on race. Because the Democratic Party is now the party of saying, well, it's okay to discriminate against certain races, and it's okay to prefer certain races. Now, to get to your question, Tom Follery, we had historic laws that oppressed people based on skin color. No doubt, that's heinous. All of those laws that existed certainly should be removed from the books. Absolutely, you won't agree, disagree. The problem is we can't fix that by arbitrarily saying, okay, and now we'll have racist laws that benefit the same groups that the racist laws before harmed. So what we would do is look at this. Let's say, for example, laws that allowed redlining disproportionately affect the African-American community. I would say that's probably true, though I'm still looking for data uh, as to how it affected other races, but I'm willing to say that it probably affected African-Americans worse. That's horrible. So if you were to try to fix that today with the law and said, well, we now need to help people that, were, that are in the low economic scale that need help buying houses, I would have no problem if your law would be, we're going to help poor people that need help buying homes. If it's true that black people are disproportionately poor, guess who that law would disproportionately help? Black sure, that's, people. That's but here's the problem. But... The way you're phrasing it, this is what ends up happening. 
we end up having these conversations that say, ah, what, like, this is the example I always use. That I'll try to make this as quick as possible. Let's say we have two people, a black person born today named Bob, a white person born today named Will. Both are born to single mothers. Both of those mothers are making $20,000 a year. Both of them live in the same community. It's going to be really tough for both of those kids. They're growing up without fathers. They're growing up in a lot of poverty, right? Why should we have policies that help Bob, the young black kid, but not Will, the young white kid? It makes no sense. It's patronizing, it's racist, and inevitably, 30 years from now, when we see that the races that weren't benefited by those policies now have poor people, those people are going to say, now we need policies that specifically help our race, because our tax dollars went to the government that only benefited people from other races. The only way to stop this racial division is to have policies that don't focus on race. If it's true that certain races are disenfranchised, those policies focusing on class will disproportionately help those races. If I may, uh, if I can just jump in here for a moment. Uh, it's in discussions like these that I'm remembering a quote from Dr. Uh, Congressman Dr. Ron Paul when he mentioned that our rights come to us uh, by the fact that we're individuals. Your rights don't come to you from a group. There are no group rights. There's no one that could negotiate for these groups, and there's no one that could have the foresight to make those calls calls for the groups. So we can only really look at individual rights and deal on, with people on an individual basis. And to me, that is the fairest way to look basically to deal with every individual person. And I was asked in the chat what I'm smoking on this evening, a Punch Classico Nicaraguan cigar in honor of a man who used to have formerly nicotine stained fingers and now heaven bound fingers. The one great Rush Limbaugh, RIP Rush. Okay, you wanna get in? You're muted. Okay. Ah, she you just said the meaning of life. Ah, gosh, it was so brilliant. Uh, something that I kind of wanted to address here is like we're, whenever we're talking about fixing the issues, particularly whenever it comes to minorities, um, I do think that there are certain things still happening in our country that specifically target minorities. For example, minority neighborhoods are more heavily policed and, and it's it's not just the fact that minority neighborhoods, like these poor neighborhoods, are more likely to be higher higher residencies of minorities. It's that like policing specifically targets minorities. I mean, you can look at things like um, racial profiling and things like that. I think that there are certain things in our legal system that are still targeting minority communities. That whenever we're talking about making things better for minorities that we do need to specifically target whenever talking whenever we're talking about it, we need to specifically target them in the context of them being minorities mm -hmm. so okay though is it pop is it also true that there in some of those neighborhoods there is a higher like degree of crime and so they're actually targeting those neighborhoods because there's more crime happening in those neighborhoods Yes, absolutely. I mean, right. there are there is a high level of crime happening in these neighborhoods. But whenever you have issues like, for, like I think that racial profiling is a perfect example of this. Like, it's not just the fact that there are higher crimes in these neighborhoods whenever it comes to racial profiling. It's that a, mm -hmm. a cop sees a, a black man walking down the street in a poor neighborhood and a cop sees a white man walking down the street in the neighborhood. These people are treated differently based solely on their skin color. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like to bring up uh, anecdotal evidence, but I do have uh, a friend that I grew up with. He was like my brother. He became a cop just uh, a few counties over from me. And they are specifically taught in training about racial profiling. It does happen. I'm not saying that it happens in every, in every police school or in every county or in every state, but it is something that does still happen. And it is something that does need to be addressed. Yeah, I don't know so that like it's... racial profiling is big of a deal now as it used to be but i think that if we say like minority communities are committing more crimes and so we're going to send more police in there i think that's like a good instinctive reaction but it probably also has the same effect where it's just uh uh you know a never-ending cycle where because you send more police now you're catching more crime and you're catching more crime mm -hmm. so you send more police and it just it, you know does it okay it, so, so what would this can, I, it, it, can I just have one moment uh, just just one little aside uh it also doesn't help that like my god there's like 
every one of us on this panel could step out our door and commit three felonies in two minutes. It is so easy to commit a felony in America. They've made everything a freaking felony. So that that is one uh, unfortunate reality of it is that now it's just everything is True. building up there. So that is a very big problem is... Yeah, like I don't, I don't know how, what you would call that—the over felonization of our criminal justice system, or what, what have you. But that is I, one big problem, and I yield back the balance of my time. You, I can, let's, go I to, can, let's go to redneck and then Rob. I, I can. I mean, I, I kind of try to fast forward and break it down for y'all. Um, I, I guess, am I the oldest turning fifty in four days? Am I the oldest on the panel tonight? <laughs> yeah, officially, you're, you're yeah. the Obi Wan okay, of the so, panel. Thank you. So, 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 listen, youngsters. Um, no. Uh, I laid it out for you. In 64, the Dim Party promised black America for political purposes that we're going to fix everything that we created for the past hundred something years in the legal system. Because it was, look, we can't deny this. They say a big switch happened. They say a big switch happened. I don't know how many of y'all agree that a big switch happened. I saw 21 congressmen and senators kind of swap, and the South just got less racist, in my opinion, point blank. Because guess what? You're talking to a native Texan, born and raised in the South, was born a blue dog Democrat. Y'all know what a blue dog Democrat is? That's a racist Democrat, y'all. They're racist. They don't like anybody. They're the old, connected to the KKK people. Mm -hmm. And there's people that claim, oh, no, they weren't. They're just very central. No, they weren't. Blue dog Democrats are racist as hell. I know. I have, my, I have them in my family or had them in my family. Uh, they're gone. The, the Democratic Party sold a switch, sold a narrative. And then they took everybody off of what they said was their own reliance because they had a large population of poor, and they said that it was all based on racism for that community. Now, mind you, they didn't talk about – the Great Civil Rights Act didn't help Appalachia. It didn't help rural America. It only focused on identity politics. So what did they do? They created a cultural class of poor that was within this window. So what we're seeing today is results that they're telling us that we're the problem. We created this mess of – culturalism or classism of poor unfortunately the majority of the people that sit in that umbrella are of minority so let me fast forward it today do any of you guys know how many democrat what the percentage of democrat um what percentage of black people have to vote to help uh or to help the democrats lose an election from this point forward do you even know to lose an election mm-hmm no, I don't even know exactly. Democrats will lose every election from this point forward if 16% of the black population that voted voted for other than the Democratic Party. They voted at 9% this year, up to 13% in some areas. That's what the Democrats were frustrated about. You say you want a bigger tent. There's tons of people that have suffered on the streets. There's tons of people that have lived in the ghettos, have lived in these rural spots, have lived in these disadvantaged areas, have suffered under welfare, have realized welfare didn't do crap for them, and have bootstrapped their asses out of there. Sure. Do they say they want to help everybody? I don't know. Every time I see somebody that talks about they've come from those upbringings and now they're sitting on a lot of money, they seem to kind of get in trouble by their own people and by everybody around them because they're like, look, I, you can do it. You can make it. We saw Joe Biden today tell people, oh, well, I can forgive 10000 but 50000 I can. I'm authorized, but, you know, everybody's a number. And all I'm trying to tell you all is racism. Is, it's the word. It's the code word they're using for classism. We are facing classism. You make this much. You're here. You make this much, you're there. Everybody else, tough luck. Yeah. And it's I, classism. I, just, I don't believe it's I, racism. I, it's intentionally to divide us. That's why they're dividing us based on things like that, sexual orientation, uh, religion, all of this stuff. They're really what they're really doing, they don't want you to look and see if you're poor and you happen to be white or black or gay or straight or Muslim or Christian. They don't want you to look at each other and say, wait a minute. Why are all these wealthy people that are running our system not giving a shit about us? They don't want that. They don't want that to happen. So let's go to Kay's example here. So what's the solution then, Kay? Well, the police over policing in inner city communities. Cool. Let's pull the police out. What's that look like? Oh wait, homicides go through the roof. Who suffers the brunt of that? Not me in my community. The people that suffer based on those policies are inner city blacks that now have even less policing, which means there's more homicides in their community. So the, the, it's it's difficult to say, like, like there's an argument to be had, and I've talked in length with my friends on the left of, why are the police there? Well, if there's more violent crime, in a, it's not even about skin color, it's about geographic area. If you're a police officer in an area that has more violent crime, you're more likely to be more involved in that community as far as more traffic stops, more crime 
crimes that you're investigating, you're also more likely to use force, whether it be legitimate or illegitimate force, because there's more of likely of a chance of force being used against you. So all of those things are true. If you want to say systemic racism led to these communities being poor in these inner cities, that's a discussion worth having. But the idea that it has something to do with racist policing, I don't see the evidence for that. Now, I linked this study, though, real quick. If we're going to say, well, the evidence is that there's racial profiling is we could see the numbers. Blacks are 10% more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to be convicted, et cetera. So I linked a study that I think is worth looking at. Let me ask you this question, Kay, or anyone that wants to answer this in the affirmative. Do you think the fact that African-Americans tend to be arrested more, charged more, does that prove that we have a racist law enforcement system? I, I would say the system, not racist law enforcement okay. people, but maybe the system just because it is disproportionate at this point. So, yeah. Okay. So I think bias has a lot to do with it too, Rob. Let's, okay. I mean, look. I would disagree. Quick, though, you say quick. racism, okay, I let, say bias. Let Rob finishes. Yeah, let me finish. So, if that's the case, given just looking at the data, we could see that's what that data speaks to. What if I told you there was a group that was targeted by police compared to their counterparts far more than the discrepancy between whites and blacks? Would you say that that proves bigotry against that group then? Uh, are you talking about men? I am talking about men. And if you read the study, this is Professor Starr's research. About white shows. Men. So let me, <laughs> no, not just, no, skin color has nothing to do, just men. So let's read this uh, study from 2012. If you're a criminal defendant, it may help a lot to be a woman. At least that's what Professor Starr's research on federal criminal cases suggests. Starr's recent paper, Estimating Gender Disparities in Federal Criminal Cases, looks closely at the large data set of federal cases and reveals some significant findings. After controlling for the arrest offense, criminal history, and other prior characteristics, men receive 63% longer sentences on average than women do. This gender gap is about six times as large as the racial disparity. So if we have a systemically racist country because blacks are targeted more than whites by police, the disparity between men and women being targeted is six times worse than that. So when will we see marches on the street and calls for laws that benefit men only, seeing as how they're the victims of misandrous policing and a misandrous law enforcement system? But we commit core crime. All right. Well, well, that's gonna, not what that's they the said. That's I'm not gonna, what they the said. We're making with black people, though. Right. We're also I'm, saying I'm gonna, that they commit we wanna, more crime. We want to transfer this over to a con <laughs> like a conversation about the the discrepancies between the sexes in our society. Yes. We can exactly. Yes, this is this is what about is. Uh, I don't like, think. I don't, that's not I don't think there's enough is. men here. I don't think there's it's, enough men here to cover that one, Kay. Because you. How is that? Excuse me. How's that? What aboutism? The point is this: we're talking about stand. What aboutism is a tool that's used so often so that people could weasel out of the fact that they have double it's, standards if we're just real quick if we're looking at a data set and saying look we need to solve oh, this sort of bigotry or uh, uh this sort of racism because the fact that blacks are 10 percent more likely to get longer criminal sentences than whites and we as a society we need to stop that because that's evidence of bigotry that we need to end then why wouldn't we end an even bigger example of bigotry we're, we can say both though and that's okay. the point is we should be saying like hey let's do both if we believe that the issue with men is a problem that needs to be fixed and we would also say that the issue with do black we? people or other men yeah i mean i know i know lots of uh intersectionality uh or intersectional feminists do um i know that they make a big deal about it i don't know they don't it's the exact opposite that, that <laughs> at least the ones in positions of power intersectional feminists ironically talk about how we have a patriarchy and men are the problem in there this is exactly Exactly what cultural they Marxism say men to. and women are both affected by the patriarchy though like that's their like slogan for right the that's their go-to right and yeah. it's a clever trick of words that they use that they constantly want to substitute patriarchy for men and imply that uh, just like when we look at that white people are always the oppressor and people of color are always the oppressed they also try to use that same tool when it comes to men versus women and say men are the oppressor women are the oppressed now yes some mm -hmm. men can also be oppressed but the only oppressors are men at least when it comes to masculinity being the oppressor that's why we talk about toxic masculinity, I, I but not toxic feminine. The point is, it's quite clear what's going on, and it's disingenuous to think that in the mainstream narrative and the people in positions of power, that if there is a group that's being bigoted against six times worse than the group that they're putting all of their energy in, it's quite clear to me that they don't give a shit about the targeting of men. You know that. We all know that in this panel. And it's disingenuous to say, well, we can tackle that problem too, because that's not how it plays out in reality. In reality, we continue to blame men and say that they're somehow oppressors more often than they're oppressed and no one cares that they're targeted so much more by law enforcement and the reality is because of what Brento Box said well wait a minute don't men commit more crimes exactly so the real argument is you can't just look at a data set and say this proves bigotry the real sure. argument is why is it that men are arrested more
more? Why is it that police are more in inner city communities? That's the real argument, but instead, what we see from our friends in the left, they just want to say, nope, the fact that the data shows that inner cities are targeted more by police proves racism. Maybe not from them, maybe from somewhere else, but it proves racism, and that's garbage and what we need to be fighting against. All right, I'm going to jump in now. I've, I've been quiet, and I've listened to everybody's point. There's one thing that everybody is overlooking here, and that's population density. The biggest issue with rural versus urban is population density. Population density directly uh, affects COLA, which is a cost of living adjustment. When you take somebody who's collectively lived and built their life skills and their, their living standards in a rural population and you migrate them in mass to an urban setting, what ends up happening is two things. One, you're taking a labor skill set out of its native environment and moving it into a, a completely new ecosystem where they're not currently trained or qualified to operate within. The second and most important is you've dramatically impacted their cost basis. Uh, for instance, if you took the average urban uh, person and you moved into a rural area, they're going to thrive because they're going to experience a dramatic adjustment to COLA in their favor. If you invert that, it's going to hurt them dramatically because you're going to dramatically increase their cost basis. The issue is, is in the 50s and 60s, there was a massive migration effort to move minorities into the urban settings. And the issue with that was on the promised basis of jobs. The problem with that is, is that was on the basis of jobs being available, but they made no emphasis towards training. And so there was no reskilling involved. And what ends up happening is you dump a lot of people that collectively stay with their cultures in a region where they're all moving in together as collective societies existing in one macro society. And the problem with that is that's what urbanism is. It is a collision of multiple cultures and societies in one collective institution in a very small mass of land. That's how you get mega, uh, uh, mega cities or metropolises. The issue is, is the largest populations of minorities are in metropolises. And the issue with that is, is that they're all competing for the same resources where everything is already dramatically limited and against their favor. It has nothing to do with the patriarchy. It has nothing to do with wealth. Wealth has been proven to be built overwhelmingly in single generations for the past multiple generations, at least five, five to 15. And so it has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with your ability to adapt to your ecosystem, to collectively adjust your current situation to a new one, and Hold that on. requires reskilling. You just – it sounds like – maybe I misunderstood. It sounded like you just disproved your own point. Did you just say that wealth was built over generations? No, wealth is built in a single generation. The yeah. overwhelming majority of millionaires and billionaires are first generation. I was but about to say, the, we, we've all the heard the phrase – of wealth is lost over the course of three and a half generations. Yeah, Massive we've all wealth, heard the, yes. Uh, yeah, we've all if heard the billionaire, phrase the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. That's the old phrase. You know, the, the person mm -hmm. who built this, mm -hmm. the generation, built the wealth, had hard shirt sleeves and worked their way up. And then three generations later, that – their offspring is back to shirt sleeves again. That's uh, it's an old phrase, and also it, it, keeping it with something that Falnor said. Uh, now I know this is kind of an anecdote, but there is at least some mass to go with it. Um, when my grandmother was growing up, she grew up uh, about 15 miles away from a town called Nicodemus, Kansas, and it was an all like 95% black town in the middle of Kansas, and uh, their income was about on par with anybody else around their area. I mean, it was the dirty 30s, so everybody was suffering. But at the same time, it was a town that was born, lived, and it's kind of on its way out in the same way that most Midwestern towns are. It had a really big grain boom. Everybody had a bunch of kids. The kids all move off to the city. All the old folks moved to the old folks' home, and that's the end of that town. It happens all over the place. But uh, in keeping with what you're saying, like, yeah, I mean, the, their life was just like the Czech town, the German town, the Swedish town, which is how the towns all kind of formed around here. Uh, like in uh, the town I'm on here, like English wasn't even spoken on the main street until about the 1940s. So uh, it, just a fascinating thing. Like I know it's just an anecdote. It's just a town of like 3,000 people. I only went there twice when I was a kid to pick up parts, but it, it was a real thing, and it, it was just like any other town.
So I yield back. No, it's, it's an excellent point. And that in combination with what I was saying, it, what, what we're seeking to say is that you should look at data and the reason for the data, as opposed to jumping to a conclusion that the data itself proves some sort of bigotry or prejudice. So when we see, so for example, when I'm talking about the gender issue, the reality is we all know there are a lot of reasons why men are more likely to commit crime than women. It's just true. But if we just, the point is to point out that that data is six times worse than the difference between whites and blacks. So we all know as humans, we're like, well, yeah, men at the extremes tend to be more aggressive, which those are the groups that usually end up in jail and prison. So it makes sense, right? When we're talking, so to go further than Falinor makes the point as to why we see it's, it's not just crippling poverty, it's crippling poverty in high population dense areas where there's hard to have for uh, a generational or where there's hard to kind of get yourself out of there for the reasons that Falinor is talking about. And so we then could, once you can't solve a problem until you correctly identify it. So if we continue to just yell racism, racism, racist cops, the problem is then it all of a sudden, because you've misidentified the problem, what's the solution that we're being offered? Well, defund the police, pull the police out of there. That's the, that's the solution. And then what happens? We see massive uptick in violent crimes in these same communities. And so for this thought experiment, so that predominantly a bunch of, uh, you know, liberal, you know, people that don't live in these inner cities, so they could virtue signal and feel good about themselves. They're not saying no police in my neighborhood. Nancy Pelosi's not saying no police in my neighborhood, defund police in my, why isn't she saying that? They're running their experiment somewhere. They'll never have the misfortune of living. So they say less police in Minneapolis, less police in Chicago, less police in poor areas of New York City. And then who suffers? It's not us. It's not Nancy Pelosi. It's those people that live in those communities. And so that's why it's important to correctly identify this problem and stop focusing on these race-based solutions. We want to help inner cities. Let's help inner cities. Leave the race out of it. Well, I would say that it's not even really that. Just look at the response time for EMS, for instance, for a rural area versus an urban area, and then also take in population density uh, and per capita per police. The issue is is that urban cities have dramatically more police, and the response times are at least half on average. You take those two into consideration, you're going to have more policing instances. Mm -hmm. Then you also take into consideration – that you have more minorities and you have more poor people. It has nothing to do with discrimination against minorities. It has everything to do with just sheer raw statistics. If it takes 45 minutes for the sheriff to get to my house from where they're currently at, which it takes a long time for them to get here. It, we're in the middle of fucking nowhere. And then you take it an urban area where there's a police station between 5 and 15 minutes from you, your response times are dramatically higher. So you're going to have more arrests. You're going to have more issues for domestic abuse. You're going to have more issues for everything from assaults to murders to rapes. That's just what it is. The more people you have in a more densely populated area, the more instances and occurrences that are negative in nature, whether they're illegal or just negative. That's just simply the case from the sheer raw statistics. And that's why you have more policing in urban areas. It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with population. And then and going you, on with that, just real quick, right? Go ahead. That's why you see more speeding tickets, right? If there are more cops there, there's more cops to pour more people over for speeding tickets and things like that, right? So if you live in an area where you rarely see a cop, what's your chance of getting a speeding ticket? Not very it's high. Not if you live in an area where you drive three blocks and you saw five police officers, your chances of getting a nonviolent like traffic violation is increased as well. And Falinor, I'd be interested because you sound like someone who might know if this data exists. I suspect, and I've said this for a long time, it's hard to find this sort of data. I would suspect that a black person who lives in rural America, their numbers would look like what we normally say white people, the average of white people. You know what I mean? As far as incarceration rates, likelihood to have negative interactions with police. And a white person that lives in the inner city would be more likely to look like traditionally what we say the average is for black people. And it's because exactly that, because it's skewed in the ways you're saying. So it's more about the geographical location and the problems that you're isolating than it is the race. And if you took the, if you took, if these, if somehow we could do an experiment and switch who lived where, you would see the exact same problems in massively overpopulated inner city poor white communities. So it's not about skin color; it's about the location and what's going on there. All right, well, we're gonna I, go to we're gonna go to Redneck real quick. So uh, two examples. I, I'll I'll try to wrap up my thoughts with Fallon and Rob's points. Um, Rob, they're called trailer parks and meth heads. 
Tons of them. <laughs> okay. So if you want to know what the inner city version of the ghetto is, they are in inner cities. They do have trailer parks surrounding inside of big cities. And that's usually where you'll find a ton of white people and a ton of meth. So, you know, it was the crack cocaine and the coke and the, and the drugs that only affected minorities. Well, it was mostly meth and coke and crack and the other drugs that affected the whites too. Um, on the point that no leftist wants to talk about, and every time we bring it up, they, they immediately say, well, it's redlining, or no, that's you can't use that example. They don't like talking about it. Everything can be solved if you just look at Chicago. Just look at Chicago. Take the greatest American city supposedly in the world with the highest black population other than Houston, Texas, because you know when you take those two and compare them, they pretty much are demographically all the same, finances, population, uh, culture, class, blah, blah, blah. But Houston doesn't have as much history to me as even on a native Texan as Chicago has for all of us. Chicago's been a melting pot just like New York City for a majority of its time. And it has failed the black community. And it has had no Republican interference. For almost 100 years, none. They have controlled everything. Have they passed laws to fix this stuff? Why not? Why are they not policing their own areas? Why? Why are the police allowing so many people to die? They passed gun laws. That didn't help. They're saying, oh, it's because it's coming in from other country, uh, other states. Still doesn't negate the fact that black-on-black -black crime is extremely high there. So you would think that this culture that created it would actually fix it. And it ain't. And, and I'm just, I, I never see anybody on the left or even right even explain to me why Chicago has as many problems as it does when one party has led it religiously for a minimum of 80, 100 years. But you, I'll, forget it. I'll just say for the past 60 years. I'll even go that far. That's enough time to make the changes. And it never happened. So the, to me, when I see the Democratic Party talking about the oppressions and the, and the, and Kay, you did mention earlier about the, 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 um, Dang it, what's the term? Racial profiling. Um, it is all built around that system to protect that lower class, keeping them down. We got to keep this in place because this is what drives us in power. It keeps us in power. That's so all jump, this is. So I'll jump in there at that piece. So to answer your question, Rob, the data does exist. I can't say what that data says. I haven't translated to look at it from that perspective, but the data does exist. DOJ's published it. Um, and to answer your question, Redneck, the biggest issue with cities when you're comparing red versus blue, just being party biased, um, one of the biggest issues with democratically run cities is they have the highest tax brackets uh, on their urban areas. And so you have local uh, taxes, you have city uh, state taxes, and then you've got obviously federal taxes. And the issue is, is that taxing has a compounding effect. When you're taxing just for living in a locality like a metropolis, and then you're taxing for living in a state – and they're taxing for living um, uh, for federal, those things all compound. And when you add them together, it dramatically impacts the overall outcome, which is the net income that comes to the person's pocket. And that impacts their bottom line. The more money you take from someone, the less that they have. The less that they have, the more that they need. And if someone needs something enough, they're going to take it because they have to have it. And that causes right. a lot of crime. And, and that's Yeah, but that's, Fowl, that's the, the point, reality. right? That's what I'm saying. Dims, why do they do this? Why do they keep raising the tax? But not delivering the goods and services. Chicago because is a perfect have, example because they have faith that they can create some kind of a system that'll alleviate the problems, and then they'll always just they always just think that they're just not getting enough funding. Or that well, that so something right. well the issue so is we allowed is, we allowed Trump to take all that rap as conservatives because we voted for him, right? We I, at least I voted for him to change all this to break that up, mm -hmm. and he didn't. He couldn't. Well, so how the, are we going to move forward? The how are we going to get? There's... We're sitting here talking about all these problems, but I don't see no way to fix them. Well, it, that was kind of my point from the beginning is that like we, we kept moving over to what it is that the Democrats are doing wrong. But my point from the beginning was like I feel as though us as right wingers kind of just ignore um, this altogether because we believe that like just doing these things based on immutable characteristics is going to be wrong from the very get go. But if we if we hurt them based on immutable characteristics and i feel like we should do something to fix it based on immutable characteristics i just think that the democrats are for sure doing it wrong and i think that there are ways that we could fix these systems especially starting with the uh, with the welfare system i have a huge problem with the way that's run i got issues with all sorts of social programs that are run in the the way that they're done and i think that they do end up hurting these communities more than anything um and so i think that we could still do these things just 
do them correctly or do them in a proper way to where we're not uh, just uh, trying to, you know, get black votes or, or something like that, you know? Well, the issue is pandering is what it comes down to is, is I create my own problem. And this is what the Romans did way, way back in the day is it's, uh, it's where the, uh, the bread dole comes from is they tax the people intentionally into poverty so that they could then give them back food as a means of feeding the people, creating the earliest forms of, of major countrywide social systems for which they could use to then leverage to control the populations. And that's what this is all about. You want to move people from rural regions to urban regions where you have a large population density and a very small landmass so that you can control them. And, and that's been the objective since the Roman times. This isn't just an American issue or a European issue. This goes back to before most of these countries even really existed in the twinkle of their daddy's eyes. Like these, these are issues that predate most of civilized societies. And the issue is, is it comes down to power. And the more power that collectively you give politicians, the more problems they're going to create so that they can leverage, so that they can quote-unquote fix the issue. Because the reality is, is they're never going to try to actually resolve the problem. Because if they resolve the problem, then what power do they have? Because what do they have to offer? If you have no problems, there's nothing that can be remediated, so there's nothing that someone can offer you. Exchange is made on the basis that you have something that is desired, and someone has something that you desire, and you equivocally want the other thing, so you swap. And the issue is, is if you have no problems to remediate, you have no power to, to effectively leverage because you have no means to resolve a problem. And, and that's a self that's a circled uh, argument there, which is why these problems are never going to be resolved by the current parties because that's how they draw their power. Republicans draw their power by alleviating taxes, and Democrats draw their power by creating taxes because they leverage their party power base from the poor, and the Republican Party collectively leverages their power from the rich. And there's just – there's no reason for either party to resolve their issues for each other because if they do, they're going to take power base from each other, and that's not what they want. They want to amass all the parties centrally, which is why neither party wants us to have a third party. Well, I mean part of the problem is that like uh, politicians' only job is to get reelected, right? Once they get voted in, all they're supposed to do is do things that the people who are going to vote for them next time will like. That's all. That's their entire responsibility, and that's the way the system is supposed to work. Is they're supposed to do these things so that they get reelected. The problem is that they're they they're not they're convincing people that this is what's best for them to get those votes again without actually doing what's best for them. So it, it gets them reelected. I mean, yeah. Go ahead, like, Rob. Okay. Sorry. I, I was just gonna say, yeah. I mean, this is exactly what I said in my opening statement, right? Right. The idea, both the establishment and Republican, Republican and Democratic Party, they don't want to help people. They haven't for years. They want to keep people in a perpetual state of saying, oh, this side fights for me and I need their help. And therefore, I'll vote for them, even if they don't do what I like. But the other side's worse. That's perpetually what they want us to do. And what you see, particularly in these inner city areas, but with the establishment and particularly Democratic Party in itself, is that they want everyone reliant on the government. If you're self-sufficient... That's less power for the government. They want to be able to control your life more and more and more power for them. It could be because they're corrupt and power hungry. It could be because they legitimately think that if you just gave them all the power, they know what's best for people. And they treat you like a child and say you don't know what's best for yourself. Either way, the best way for them to obtain power is to keep you in a perpetual state of needing them to survive. If inner city, like for example, take education. The teachers unions are one of the worst organizations in this country, not only for the deplorable conditions that we see in the inner cities, but just as far as how corrupt and how terrible it is for the actual country in the first place. They have no incentive to make education better. They have every incentive to create less and less education so that they say we need more and more resources. If all of a sudden inner city education started to go through the roof and testing scores went up, then all of a sudden there'd be less of a need for them to say we need more and more and more. So that's why you see teachers unions doing things like fighting against charter schools which are proven to work and fighting against reopening even though all science shows that that's the direction we should go look at the reactions to covid the same people particularly in the democratic party but elsewhere that say we care about the working class we care about the poor people 
the lockdown policies in, con in conjunction with the stimulus policies that they have pushed has been one of the largest transfers of wealth in this country's history in such a short period of time from poor and working class people to the wealthiest Americans. Do you think that's an accident? And their bargain that they make for you is, well, okay, you can't go to work anymore, but that's okay, we'll give you a stimulus. We'll pay you to stay at home. So it works out for you. And now people who, through no fault of their own, have been crushed by these lockdown policies are begging to be able to survive. So it becomes an argument. We're literally in a pissing match between the Republicans and Democrats. The number one electability issue right now, I would guess, if we had another election, is who's going to send me more money? That's what I want. Who's going to send me more money? And it might sound like a good deal for you right now, but once you're dependent on them, that's it. And generational after generational, we've told people in these inner cities, the world's unfair against you. It's racist. It's terrible. This country's horrible. You can't succeed. We need to give you more. You can't be held to the same standard of other people. How would you react if you were told that generationally? I know how I would react. I'd say, yeah, life is unfair. I'll take what I need. I need the government to intervene because I'm unable to achieve on my own. That's what's terrible about the system. I totally agree with Fallon Fallen that we see there is no incentive to make things better. And both parties are in on this. Both parties do this at the establishment level. And until we get out of this trap, we're going to be going for a lot worse times in the future. Rob, okay. well, I just like I, to... I do want to try to move on in just a minute. Well, so if anybody I, has some last words that we're, where we're not repeating just, things that are of our... Yeah. So we're going to go to... We'll go to Phil first, and then we'll go to Fallon. Hey! Awesome. I knew you were a philosopher king, Tom best host ever oh wait uh, so uh i will say that uh when you're talking about uh i believe yes it was rob who was talking about well the biggest issue in an election if you're going to have another election like next week is who's going to send us more money that is boy that is uh not a good place to be now i was always under the impression now both sides have done it nobody can really uh nobody can go uh bald faced on this one but I was always under the impression that buying votes was like a bad thing or illegal, but now we've got both parties doing it openly and plainly. And just one thing I'd like you all to keep in mind, I forget what historian said it, but he said, in ancient Rome, when the electorate figured out that they could vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury, that particular transmission did not stop until the last bone of the last taxpayer was picked bare. Just a little bit of a history before we move on. And I yield back to you, beautiful people. Hey, go ahead, Fauner. All right. Um, I had a cheap shot I was going to send in there, but I'm going to keep it to myself. Um, <laughs> it's actually aimed at Tom. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to correct one thing for there, Rob. So the the issue is it's not the teachers. Um, and, and I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, especially coming from a, a right wing panel. But the issue with teaching actually starts at the state level, which originates from the federal level, which comes from the Department of Education. And that is stipulated by Congress. So the Congress is the ultimate source to blame for bad education in America, from everything from No Child Left Behind to other policies that have effectively dramatically impacted our performance in education, which has dropped dramatically since the 1950s. And so we used to be dominating in that space. The big issue is, is teachers have effectively given up uh, trying to fight that battle, and the unions are focusing on protecting the teachers at this point, and they've stopped trying to fight Congress because they've given up any means of, of actually being able to actually make any difference because they don't hold the votes to do it. And the parents don't actually care enough to start voting the targeting towards improving education directly by targeting Department of Education, uh, which would then eventually put pressure on Congress who would actually make the changes. And so it's not the teacher's fault because they their entire pay base and their ability to keep their jobs are directly correlated to performance on state tests, which directly correlate to how much funding they get per student. So from the financial model, from congressional space and DO ed space, people who actually perform well they make a shit ton more money than the other places. And the issue is is that in order to improve that and get the money that you need, that money is centralized based on performance. And so the teachers that have more pay are going to perform better than teachers who get less pay because they get better people because they can pay more. And that is a self-defeating cycle which has been built in by Congress. And so if you want to change the issue with education in America, you have to change how funding is given to schools, which only Congress can change on the direction given by Department of Education, who takes almost no direction from the teachers' unions. 
And so that's where the focus has to has to start. I completely I completely disagree because if that was the case, can you explain to me why the Biden administration right now currently is forcing the director of the CDC to walk back their actual scientific basically consensus that it's safe for teachers to return to school and for students to return to school all at the behest of the teachers unions. The teachers unions so powerful that it literally got Biden and the Biden administration to walk back the public statements of the CDC. That's how powerful they've been. And it's if they were really just concerned about what well, we want to provide better education. I'm not talking about specific teacher. I'm talking about the union here. If they were really concerned about providing better education, even if it was for selfish reasons to get more money, why in God's name would they be pushing to continue remote learning, which certainly we've seen is driving these scores into the dirt. If you're right that the teachers unions had nothing to do with it, they would be clamoring to go back to work because they'd say, no, 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 we need those test scores to increase so we get more money. Instead, they are the single biggest advocate and reason that Congress and the Biden administration is not going to force teachers back to work so i can answer that pretty quickly how good is money and what does it do for you if you're dead from the teacher's perspective that's how they see it the average teacher is actually pretty aged uh in their in their age basis so when you actually go to the process of getting your bachelor's or master's it takes time so you're going to land in somewhere between your 26 to 30s early 30s <laughs> then you're going to typically spend between two and five years trying to find a job in your industry when you fail to do so that's when you typically pursue a teaching career in your early 30s to maybe mid 40s early to mid 40s and so the average age of a teacher is actually pretty high um and the issue is, is it's a, it's a safety concern for them, and they're concerned for themselves. And from their perspective, they are being selfish. They're worried about themselves getting sick because they're exposed on average of 25 to 1 ratios in these classrooms where any one of these kids could have COVID, and they are themselves worried about getting COVID. And it is for selfish reasons, which is why they're pushing for remote learning because it's an alternative to where they can both, A, get back to school and make money, and B, do it without exposing themselves to people with COVID. And we all agree remote learning is garbage. It's, it's one of the reasons why I dropped out on my first colleges is they suck, but that's them being selfish and protecting themselves. And to the answer that, the second part of that question is, is the teachers do push for more learning, and they do push for advancements. The issue is, is that you have teachers that make more money in areas where they perform better, and then you have teachers that when they can't get the funding, the, the specifically the administrators – if you don't have the funding to allocate to pay for teachers in the first place, you can't hire the better teachers. So you hire whatever you can find at the pay rate that you have to offer. And so, for instance, you're going to have, on average, more teachers with master's degrees in areas that have more pay. And so they may even have years of industry combined with a master's degree, whereas in you're going to be lucky if you can get somebody with a bachelor's degree that barely passed their, their exams and then passed their teacher's exam. It's it's just simply the way it is. As money it's, controls it's, and dictates decision, I'm not going to take a third of the pay that I've been offered from between two places simply because I want to go out and I want to help somebody. I'm going to be a teacher because I want to teach and I want to help kids, but I'm not going to take a 50% pay cut so I can go teach the poorest kids. Very few people okay, are actually true. altruistic. They're that's selfish. true, but you're, you're wrong on the first part of that. For example, according to the .gov website, the average age of teachers in the United States is about 42 years old. If you look at the mortality rates for people that are 42, it's a joke. And not only that, study after study has showed not only are kids so less likely to be to get COVID, they're also less likely to have serious side effects or transmit it. So we could see that there are very few cases worldwide where schools have been open where we've actually seen teachers that got COVID that was transmitted by students. And so when we see that you're wrong, that it's like they're not in this age group. Average, like actual advice. <laughs> they're not in this group where it's like uh, they're 65 or 70 years old on average. They're 42, which your chances of dying there are very slim. But the science shows that actually being at school is one of the safest places, not just for students, but also for teachers. They're more likely – Most some of the studies I've seen show that teachers are more likely to get COVID doing remote learning because they end up in other situations where they otherwise would be in these classes and are at very low risk to receive transmission than they would if they're out in grocery stores or in their own home where transmission missions occur quite frequently. So it's clear to me that even if you say, well, they're fearful, it's clear that this is selfish motivations. Let's not beat around the bush. They want to get paid to stay at home. 
That's what they want. They're using this so, because they, they've even started to say, well, actually, schools were unsafe before COVID. We need more money. We need more money here. We need more money there. And we've actually seen the CDC said, we've came up with recommendations in working in collusion or conjunction with teachers unions. So this, what we see happening right now, the travesty and all of the ill effects that comes with the lack of education, increased suicide from students, increased malnourishment, increased abuse occurring at home, all of this is known as is the data showing that it's not that dangerous for teachers to go back to work. And the teachers unions don't care. They say, we want ours, who cares about the education or the health of these kids? That's what's going on. Like, I, I, just, I, I just don't buy that, you know, well, it's because they're old and they're fearful of COVID. The science and the average age of the teachers don't back that up. So let me jump in there at that point. So you actually said it perfectly, the studies that you've read, the data that you have, it's not what you know, it's what you believe. And if you believe that if you go to a place and it's going to make you sick, or if you go somewhere you're going to die, are you going to go there? If you if that's what you believe, not what's provable, not what facts say, what you believe. Because people believe that the world's flat. It's what they believe, and that's what matters. We can say, oh, well, here's a, here's an actual globe. Here's pictures from space. Here's a mathematical possibility that says that it's impossible for the world to be flat. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you show them. It matters what they believe. That's okay. why religion has such a major influence. It's what you believe. But and that's, that's true, the problem with McDonald's teachers. workers going back. Because they need money to survive. But again, oh, so that's they can exactly still believe the that they're going to be – they can still believe that they're at risk. They can still believe they're going to get sick. They can still believe they're going to die. But they know for a fact if I don't go to work, I'm not going to have food, and I'm going to die anyways. Okay. And this is what a lot of small business uh, owners are saying. Rob, go ahead and answer. We'll go to Brento Box, and then we'll, we'll move okay. on. But the difference, and that's exactly the point. The reason is because there's not a powerful union for fast food workers, right? So again, it comes there's back a to union the, for fast food. Yeah, but not a powerful one. Not one that's powerful enough to say we want to get paid to stay at home like the teachers unions. The Look, food it's, it's and beverage union is the largest union in the world, just so What's you know. That? The food and what? beverage unions are the largest unions in the world. So they have a larger population. The, so do you think that just because it's such a large union that they have the power that the teachers unions have? That's, that's your argument? Hostess I mean, actually killed Hostess by having the union kill it. Right. Well, it's not even close, and that's why teachers un that's why the teachers unions have had so much success. You could say, well, they didn't know what the data was, but the government knows the data, and the scientists know the data, and it'd be real simple for them to clear it up and say, actually, teachers, uh, you're going to be safe to be there. And the fact that they're not doing that is because of the power of the teachers unions, because they're able to convince we want all of this other stuff. I'm sorry, I don't believe that teachers are more ignorant on this issue than anyone else. They know they could read the data just like me and you and everyone else here. They know that schools are one of the safest places to be and yet their unions are pushing for them not to return because they want to exploit this for a bunch of things that they wanted anyways and they want to be able to get paid to stay at home and not work and if they're not if they they better what if you're a teacher you should be pushing your union to stop this crap because eventually you know what's going to happen people like us are going to say you know what why am i paying property taxes to pay these teachers to go to school if they're not going to school and teach i'll just take care of my kids education myself that's what the end result's going to be if the teachers unions aren't careful well that's right, we're, we're, we're going to go to brento box you can get the last word on this and then we'll move on yeah i don't have a strong uh opinion on the on the teachers union um i was going to respond to you a little while ago when you were just saying that uh that politicians only job is to get reelected and i you know i mean you're not wrong but it's definitely a cynical way of putting it uh i don't really think that's an accurate way of putting it it's like saying everyone's job at their job job at the job is just to not get fired and it's like okay yeah yeah, I know, of course, right? But I mean, your 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 job should be it. There's an actual function right now. Sure, it's a well, pragmatic way of looking at it. Yeah, right. I I understand that. I understand that. Yeah, you know, a politician's a politician's job is uh, primarily representation, right? And then they become corrupt at the point if the tail starts wagging the dog, and then they're controlling the electorate to keep themselves in power and they're influencing it. Then yes, then that is has a backwards relationship. Well, and I don't uh, think anybody true. would argue against the fact that politicians absolutely do the bare minimum. Uh, I, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I, be, I, I Depends suppose, on the politics. I, I, I feel like I want to, yet. but uh, I, don't, I, I think a lot of people do the bare minimum, too. Uh, that's probably true. Um, yeah, anyway, that was, that's what I was going to get at uh, and say a little while ago. We've been on uh, teachers' unions uh, for a little bit um, and whether or not they should go back. Uh I'm a little uh, terrified of the concept of an entire generation missing out on one or two years of uh, 
of education in America. That would be insane. Um, so something has to be done about that immediately. Uh, but otherwise, I, I don't have too much input on that. Okay. Um, I guess this kind of goes back a little bit to the, our opening question. So I want to know where you guys think the future of the Republican Party is going, especially with the you know the GOP Trump split. Uh, we've got a new party that's starting up that. Uh, they're calling the Patriot Party. Some people are moving towards um, a, a libertarian vote. Some people are even just moving over to the Democrats' vote um, until they think things over here get settled. Um, so, yeah, Phil, we'll start off with you, and then we'll go to Redneck. Huzzah! So we will see what happens in the coming years, folks, when it comes to uh, the Republican Party the next few years. Going to be a little bit of another civil war for the soul of the Republican Party, if you will, in, in the abstract, of course. Um, the Republican Party is, and I think the two best representatives of them, if you're looking for avatars, would be Donald Trump and Mitt Romney. Those are kind of your avatars going forward of who's going to be fighting for control of the Republican Party. Now, the thing that a lot of people, if Trump decides to run again, is there anybody on this panel that has any doubt in their mind that the Republican electorate will nominate him again? Like, is there anybody with even the, the, the tiniest shred of doubt? Now, if he doesn't, Whoever's running needs his nomination or they will not win, period. In 2024, if Donald Trump still has a breath of life in his body and he is not running for president, you need his endorsement to get elected president, period. There's no getting around that. Now, who decides to run? You know, people are saying it's one of, possibly one of Trump's kids. This is, God, I hate to say it. This might be my Ann Coulter moment, but remember when they said, who do you think is going to win? She goes, of the announced candidates right now, Donald Trump. Uh, this is my, so who has the best chance of winning right now of the announced candidates other than Phil KOE, obviously? Mock me all you want. He's a household name and it seems to work a lot. The announced candidates, Kanye West. Hey, wash me in your judgment, internet. Bring it, wash me. And I yield back to you, beautiful people. <laughs> All right, Redneck. <laughs> uh, okay, from Kanye to Redneck. Love it. I actually love Kanye. <laughs> I, no, I love hip-hop. I love rap. I'm a big rap head. Kanye is one of my – I mean, I used to hate him. I did. I used to hate him. But then I realized he had mental health, and then I was like, oh, that's why he's fucking crazy. Okay, I love this guy. He's just like me. Um, there's no such thing as Patriot Party, people. It's not real. It's just like the Tea Party, or it's just like the – the squad, it is a group of Republicans that believe in America first. They believed in Trump. They believed in his vision. They believed in what he was doing. We have to support that. We have to primary that. We have to primary that agenda. For those of us that voted for him, for those of us that are still jaded about the fact of what we've seen and what we see going on, I don't truly believe it's a true third party. I think Trump is going to play us. Uh, I think he's going to play us. He's going to play the system for us like a fiddle. And he's already doing it. He's already pigeonholed Mitch McConnell. He's already pigeonholed Pelosi, Schumer. He's already branded everybody corrupt that we know. He's exposed a shit ton of, of corruption on both sides now. He's willing to go scorched earth. And that's exactly what I wanted. When I voted for Trump in 2016, I wanted the government to go scorched earth. I wanted it changed from the inside out. And I figured that crazy son of a bitch right there could do it. So anybody that's willing to step up there, Anybody that's willing to step up and say, look, tired of corporate, I'm tired of the corporations having so much control inside of our, our politics. I'm tired of elections being rigged and everybody just accepting, oh, it's just a minor, look, it's only 1% of the population that we can assume. No, I don't want any, any of that crap. I want the constitution. I want rights for everybody equally. I want the law followed. I don't want Supreme Court justices making decisions based off their bias. I don't want to hear any more justices being political. They shouldn't have. I mean, we literally need to tear this thing down and start over. And I think that's what's going to happen. Conservatives, hopefully, will get behind this America first agenda of fixing America first. And whatever it takes to primary anybody out of office, whether they're a senator or a congressman, uh, whoever they are, that's what's going to have to happen. And, and I, I just I, I don't think. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Trump will 
take his next two or three weeks like he's been and keep chilling, keep probing around. I honestly think he's going to wait for this New York case to come to fruition or at least let them pull the trigger. He's going to wipe their floor with it. And then he's going to turn around and, and, and literally, I'm not calling Kanye. Here you go, Phil. I called this. I actually called this uh, in 2019 or 2020, early 2020. Your next Trump in office will be Ivanka Trump. She is the best sold ticket that they have. She's the first female that we will be able to say has the uh, youth, has the uh, experience, Girl. has the glamour, has all of the sales pitches you could place on the, what did they say? We're buying our votes today. Well, hell, if I'm going to buy my votes, then I'd rather buy it from her than buy it from Kamala. I'm sorry. I'm not biased. I actually love black women. For all of you who know Redneck, I am biased against black women. I love them. Love them. I don't love Kamala. So... That's that's how I'll put it. I, I think Kamala's the next one. I mean, uh, Ivanka's the next one, not yeah. Kamala. Um, Thank you. Jesus, let me slide on that one. If, uh, if I'll go. I, I think Kanye is a meme. Um, I wasn't shocked when Ann Coulter said Trump. Oh, I actually Trump. thought that. Uh, I thought that was... Um, no, see, I, I don't think Trump was a meme. I think Trump was dismissed as a meme. Uh, and that's a big part of why he won, because people... I, people were a little too full of themselves and they were caught up on laughing at people and they didn't take him seriously. Uh, I don't think Kanye is the same as Trump though. Um, I don't think just because Trump was a meme and you say Kanye is a meme that they're both memes and therefore it's the same. I don't think it's the same. Um, Kanye is, uh, he's not political. He's far more radical. He's certainly kind of a, like a revolutionary, uh, you know, musician, artist and figure. Uh, but I don't think he's the same as Trump in that regard. Uh, Ivanka could run, but I don't see her, I would see she's more of a, a torch carrier, right? She doesn't seem like a, a large political actor. She's certainly a, a entrepreneur and a businesswoman and everything Redneck said, but it doesn't seem like she's really going to carry any kind of a political uh, torture role of leadership, you know? Um, I think probably Mitt Romney is going to be the candidate for 2024. He's opposed to Trump uh, the whole time. Um, I don't know if people are necessarily going to like him because of that, but I feel like as far as Ouch. establishment goes, he would probably be the likely person by 2024 unless someone else steps up and then there's some kind of dark horse or maybe not dark horse, but maybe just somebody who no one's expected. Um, and who in this question of also who they'll be running against, they probably won't be running against Joe Biden uh, and they probably will be running against Kamala Harris. Uh, so, you know, other than Mitt True. Romney, who I think is obvious, uh, and then with a likely Kamala Harris as the, um, as the incumbent, not, not a true incumbent, you know, she's not a true incumbent to be vice president. Um, yeah, I don't know who else, who else they would run against there. I really don't think it's Kanye. No, I, I don't think it's Kanye. Sorry, Phil. I just said um, of the announced candidates. Now, I, I, Ivanka's strong, but she hasn't announced anything. So I just, that was my Ann Coulter moment, if I can just throw that caveat in. <laughs> Ann Coulter was serious, though. She was serious, and she was right, too, because she really perceived it, you know. I, I always felt I like, I always felt I like, um, oh, I right. mean, if we're going to, hey, if, if we're going to say that Ro Rip Mitt Romney is one, can I just throw drop a QAnon theory then? Like, if sure. we're going to go that far sure. to the right, oh, can I go boy. to the left of the right party? So Trump's oh going to run for Congress in 2022. He's going to win a seat. He's then going to win the House seat because he, all of the Republicans that follow his lead that are going to help overtake the House will then put him as the Speaker of the House. And then he will impeach Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And then he will then turn around and be our president. That's it. Um, that's my that's my QAnon theory. Okay, so... Okay. Um, it's got just as much chance in hell as Mitt Romney. Like, I'm just saying. Give I'm just saying. A choke slam too while the pyro goes off and the crowd I, I'm, goes. I'm just saying. Yeah! Like that was. Bad. I'm just saying. <laughs> Mitt Romney has just as much chance in hell as that. Yeah, Mitt Romney has zero chance. It, it just won't. Have, and the reason is, this is what you're going to see from the establishment Republican Party. The problem they have is that the ideas that Trump had and what Trump represented is massively popular. <laughs> And so you're going to see the Mitch McConnells of the world. They're going to, they've attacked Trump the person. So they're going to try to say, look, the ideas that Trump talked about are important, but he was a flawed person. That's the direction they're going to go. So, and I don't trust Mitch McConnell. I don't trust the establishment Republican Party at all. I think that 
at the top level, like George Carlin said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. I think Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and all of these people at the top, they never wanted Trump to win in 2016. What 2016 was, was you could see across all of the Western world that populism was rising on the left and the right. So you saw things like Brexit. You saw the rise of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I think the establishment started to look around and say, oh, shit. We're in a lot of trouble. People are getting fed up. They don't know what direction. They're not, the people weren't coalescing in one direction, but they were getting fed up with the people in charge all over the world. And so what they said was, here's what we do. Let's give a pressure release valve. We'll allow this guy Trump. He'll win the primary. We're, we know that he'll win if we don't interfere, so we just won't interfere. Bernie would have probably won on the left if they didn't interfere. So they did interfere. And they said, what we'll do is we'll have an election. Trump's so unpopular in a general election that Hillary will win. They put their thumb on the scale somewhat, but they believe their own BS, that Hillary had a 95% chance of winning. And then they were shocked when they lost. And they said, this ain't going to happen again in 2020. So they started a four-year war on Trump and Trump supporters using intelligent agencies, using Silicon Valley, using the mainstream media, the entertainment industry, all of these tools to smear Trump and populist, right? They smeared people from saying things like that you're a nationalist, that you care about the country. They said that saying make America great was racist. They did everything they could to smear the idea of Trump, right? So the establishment Republicans, they're on board with that. And so what they're going to do now that they've got rid of Trump is they now realize in order to keep our grift going, we can't lose tens of millions of people. They can't go off and say, let's form a third party or let's start primarying people. So you're going to start to see establishment Republicans all of a sudden start to say things Trump said. We need to get a handle on illegal immigration. We need to repeal Section 2, uh, what is it, uh, three, 230 or whatever. We need to repeal that. They're going to start to say all this stuff that Trump said, and they're going to put forth an establishment candidate that kind of says that sort of thing. Uh, so it's not going to be Mitt Romney because they understand Mitt Romney, Jeff Flake, people like that. They're so hated by Trump supporters that putting them up with just be an automatic loss and it would cause probably a shift to a third party is what would happen so um yeah i look for it to be somewhere more middle ground if it's a fair process someone that i think has a chance to sort of bridge the gap would be a ron DeSantis because i think he brings a lot of the things that are popular with trump's message to trump supporters but he also comes in a less vulgar package which i think would be more palpable to a lot of people in the establishment republican party mickey mouse I think Mickey oh, Mouse, Lord. and when I say Mickey Mouse, I mean somebody who's well-liked generally, but doesn't have any real heavy political alignment and doesn't really have any real place in politics. And what I mean by that is is when you look at Trump winning in 2016, <clears throat> it's not a representation of Trump being amazing about politics or being incredibly well-liked. What Trump was a representation of was a systemic – uh, effectively disassociation by the general populace with both parties. And what what that translates to is is the left was tired of the Hillary Clinton types, the traditional Democrat, and people were tired of the traditional Republican. And so what you saw was a, a factioning of both party alignments um, from pretty much 2015 forward. And as that's continued to decay, what we're headed towards is a more of an India-style um, – almost republic-based democracy where there's hundreds of political parties that are microcosms of, of political representations that will collectively collaborate to form what is effectively two or three or four or five major political bodies, and then whoever has the biggest of the pieces of pie will win the elections. And and that's been the demonstration as things move forward. People are tired of the, oh, you're either this side or you're that side. People are, are starting to realize they can disassociate themselves with this X, Y axis and take a Z position as well and say, okay, well, I'm not just X or Y. As you've seen in language in this, this panel itself is I'm not left or right. I'm this type or I'm that type or I'm this identity, and collectively that's where we're headed. So that's why I say Mickey Mouse. You're going to see somebody come out of the closet, so to speak, in terms of politics where it may not be something incredibly popular for their industry, maybe the movie industry or the scientific community or maybe even the medical industry. It definitely won't be Fauci, uh, definitely not going to be Kanye, but it will be someone who's generally well accepted or well liked by the overall community who will simply be elected not because of their politics but specifically because they're not this traditional party or that traditional party. 
but simply because they aren't. And just like with Trump, who was a radicalization of just burn the place down, drain the swamp, which was actually what made him incredibly popular. He was actually losing initially, and when they started using language drain the swamp, which this was talked about uh, heavily uh, during the initial assessments um, for uh, – who, who is that stupid company uh, that was mining Facebook data? Uh, but they were the company that actually realized if you started saying drain the swamp, you became collectively popular between both parties. And it was because they just – people were just tired of the swamp, mm -hmm. and whether you see it left swamp, right swamp, it's still the swamp monster at the end of the day, and nobody wants to live in the bayou. And, and that's just a simple reality except for maybe Florida man, which is an extremist. And, and and that's the issue with our current political ecosystem as a whole oh, is people are just tired of it. And whoever becomes the quote unquote Mickey Mouse will be the person who wins the twenty twenty four. And Cambridge Analytica, thank you, Plush. Yep. Yeah. And, and and that's the thing, it's like whoever becomes the next Mickey Mouse, it may be Ryan Reynolds for all we know. I mean, find me a person on the left or the right who doesn't like Ryan Reynolds. And it proves my point. Ah. Morgan Freeman. Find me a person who doesn't like him. I pr it yeah. proves my point. Wait. It's gonna be it's gonna be a Bill Nye or it's gonna as be a, as, a Morgan Freeman or as, a Ryan Reynolds. Uh, as soon as someone becomes political, they I become a fucking lightning rod God. for hate, and everybody will just turn on them. There is one person that could get away without that, and they mentioned it in the comments, and that is Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Like Joe exactly. Rogan said, that guy can do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, and he, he might actually win. win. You know how and he might actually win. Money, He's gonna run. Spain, and prestige he would have to give up to be president like so yeah i don't see the the rock going for that but if i may just real quick and then i'm going to hand it over to Kay. there's just two things i want to say real quick people that are saying we need to form a third party we need to start a third party trump was the closest thing we will ever see in the modern era to a third party candidate rising and winning the presidency do we all forget that he was part of the reform party back in the 90s and then he was a democrat before that and he flip-flopped to where he needed to when it was expedient for him and then he just took over the republican party he with, did not whether switch, they like it or not Phil. he didn't switch the party switched he, he was a honestly well he, no, 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 he I'm not arguing field. No, I remember. I'm, no, he I'm switched his no, registration no, I, throughout life. Yes. He yeah, has but I'm saying registration, culturally. So that's, that's all I'm saying. Now, if I may, culturally, if I may one, one, one other thing. Now, I get exactly what you're saying, man. There's been a shift in the Overton window, but there's been too many people in yeah. the comments that have been requesting this, and so I have to do it. And that is my world-famous Chris Farley impression, but I'm going to do it. As every right winger watching Bill Barr for the last two years. For the love of God, arrest someone! Jesus Christ, man! Just one person, arrest them! So there you are. Thank you. That's so good. <laughs> well done. So good. Okay, that was well that was good. That was good. That was really well good. Well, I'm gonna have <laughs> to like. I, you beautiful people. I think I'm gonna like. I'm going to disagree with all of you to an extent. Um, Rob brought up pretty much what I was going to say. I think that Ron DeSantis is inevitably, like, ultimately going to be the Republican nominee in 2024. I think they will throw up Nikki Haley in the primaries just to see how she fares. I think that they were floating with her in the at the beginning of, like, 2020. Uh, but her... She hasn't been polling very favorably in the Republican Party as of late. They don't really like her and they don't really want her. So they might throw her up in the primaries, but I think ultimately Ron DeSantis is going to take uh, the Republican nomination. Um, I think that the establishment saw Trump as kind of a roadblock because he wasn't an establishment candidate. They could not control him and they hated that. Uh, they're going to try really, really hard to get back to establishment politics. That's, that's ultimately the goal here. That's why the Democrats put up Joe Biden in the first place is because he's an establishment candidate. Um, but I think that you're going to see somewhat of a divide whenever it comes to the 2024 election because you are going to have, no matter how small of a minority it is, you are going to have people that remain loyal to Donald Trump and will stick to this idea that he's going to run in 2024 and hopes that he can win and hopes that he's going to be the nominee. And they are going to ride that all the way through the primaries were going to be there on election day 2024. Like, here's how Donald Trump can still win, even though he's not even freaking running. And you're going to have, I think that you're honestly going to have a divide on the uh, the Democratic side, too, because I do think they're going to put up 
Kamala Harris, but I think that AOC is going to run in the primaries, and then you're going to have a divide between establishment Democrats and the progressives. Um, now, I, so I've just got one I, question. I don't... Uh, may, may I just one quick question? Because sure, nobody's sure. really answered this. Uh, I, I posed it a little earlier. Now, I'm just curious to the whole panel. If Donald Trump decides to run again in 2024, big if, big if, but for the sake of this thought experiment, let's just say we are in 2024. Donald Trump says, I am throwing my hat in the ring and we are going together. We will make America greater again. And, yeah, that, and he decides he's running again. Is there anybody on this panel that has any doubt that the Republican electorate will nominate him for the Republican nomination again? I'm not saying is he going to win the primary. That's not the question. It's just will he win the Republican primary? Is there anybody that has any doubt that the Republican prime electorate would yes. win again? And I yield. Yeah, I would like Rob, to believe that the Republican that. Party is not that dumb. We'll go to Rob and Based, then Brent Obama. He would win. He would win if he ran. But here's what will happen. They won't let him, right? Because they'll – Mitch McConnell or some – they'll impeach him and convict, right? They'll do something. They'll find some scandal. I guarantee it. I gar they, they do not want Trump running again. So I don't think that they'll – I think that right now, the way it looks, if Trump ran in the primary, he would win. Because I think the evidence is quite clear that Republicans overwhelmingly support Oh, we got some emergency alert system going on. Yeah. Uh, they overwhelmingly support Trump, the electorate, more than they support the kind of the Mitch McConnell wing. So I think that that would be the case. I wanted to say real quick, to, uh, I think everyone's making good points. Like, I agree with Fallenauer that we're heading into a direction where people are furious about the two-party system. But never underestimate the ability of the establishment to go to lengths that are necessary to continue their corruption, right? Their propaganda is so powerful. So think about how this would work. So let's say Dwayne The Rock Johnson's going to run. Do you think that they're going to allow him to primary Kamala Harris or Joe Biden? Not a chance. So if The Rock runs, he's going to have to run as a Republican. Do you think that there is any chance whatsoever that the people that seemingly would like him on the left are going to vote for the rock as a republican over kamala harris i don't think there's a chance and i think the i think brento box is right not only would he be a lightning rod or anyone like that and the only chance of that type of person winning would be if they are a democrat if they run as a republican they will be torn asunder because mm -hmm. the establishment propaganda machine is going to completely think of the rock think of all the story do you have it like if you ever watch professional wrestling think of the locker room i have a revolutionary wrestling do. podcast about pro wrestling ah. <laughs> so think of it. So you know, you know, uh, my my buddy says they're basically glorified carnies. So and he loves wrestling, by the way. So right, think yeah. of the stories they would be able to have. Like think of what they'd be able to dig up on someone like that. And it would be any celebrity. There. So I think that Fallenauer is right that that's the direction things are going. And I actually support that direction. I support getting rid of this two party monopoly. And that's why I suggest this. If you really, the two party monopoly will not be ended until one of these parties is crushed into oblivion. That's the only chance. So as long as the election continues to go 48% Democrat, 52 Republican, as long as that stuff continues, the narrative will be to the electorate. And this is exactly what the establishment Republicans will be telling you. You can't go third party. You can't do it. You got to pinch your nose and vote for Nikki Haley. Or you got to pinch your nose and keep electing Mitt Romney. Because... Look at what those evil Democrats are going to do. They're going to take yeah. your guns. They're going to take your free speech. And they're not wrong. They are coming for that stuff, right? And then the, the Democrats, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter who the Republicans put up. They say Trump was uniquely evil. The next Republican to come up is going to be a Nazi, going to be a white supremacist, going to be, you know, someone who's a womanizer. That's what they're going to accuse them of. You got to keep that person out. They're going to put, you know, what did they say about Mitt Romney? He would put slaves back in chains, the black people back in chains. It's going to be the handmaiden's tale. Brett Kavanaugh is as much of a cookie cutter, like straight arrow guy as there is. They accuse the man of being a gang rapist. And it works. The Democrat electorate will be like, oh, my God, we got to get out there. We'll we'll pinch our nose and vote for Joe Biden because we have to stop those evil Republicans. And so what we need is I obviously, even though I dislike both parties, I obviously would prefer the Republicans to crush the Democrats. But if it's not going to go that way, what we need is the Democrats to just obliterate the Republicans in an election. And then the entire country, maybe it'll, you know, then the entire country will say, wow, we no longer have to listen to Mitch McConnell say, we were this close. 
We were this close. If you just give me your faith, we'll put our guy over the top, over the top next time. And that's the only way I see like a uh, change to this two party system. Curry. Imagine what we could do if everybody that said that they hated the two party system actually voted their yeah. party. <laughs> so Kay, but you're kept, well, I really I you're think, kept uh, on fear, right? Yeah. I really don't think that AOC will run. I think she's too young in her political mm -hmm. career. Not you know to run. She's going to be. She'll be thirty five, I think, so that she'll be correctly like. <laughs> but there's a cost to running for president and losing, right? And there's a lot to gain for continuing to be a congresswoman and a very popular congresswoman, you know, uh, for her party and being able to get a lot done. I, I think that <laughs> I think that her odds of winning would be very low, and the cost of running would be very high. I don't see her running in in twenty twenty four. I thought the same thing for the longest time until she went on that live stream and was talking about how she's kind of disenchanted with politics and she was questioning whether or not she was going to continue to try to pursue politics as a career. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of predict that she's going to be like a go big or go home, see how big of a support system she, not just she has, but the idea of like progressivism in, in the United States government is. And then if she loses, she's just going to kind of fade out of polit politics as far as being a politician and move more into, like, the activist realm. Um, I think that she's going to fare better being an activist. I mean, if she were to come on and do something like what we do now, she's going to be – she'd be great at it. And she'd get a, she'd garner a huge audience, not just because she was a sitting politician, but because the progressives genuinely like her. And so I think that she sees that that's mm -hmm. more of her niche. And I think that she's going to try to pull out one more big thing before she just kind of fades out of being a politician. Yeah, Phil. Kay is, ab Kay is absolutely right in this, folks. Uh, I'm telling all of you within the sound of my voice who find yourself on the American right or anyone who might potentially vote for Republican anytime in the future, you ignore Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at your own peril. She has a much greater power than a lot of people appreciate, one greater than I think even she's aware of. And that's what, there's a thing that I've been tracking for the last few years. And there's two people that get the most negative reactions out of anybody in American politics. And those two people are Donald J. Trump and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And if you have people that are negatively reacting to you, they are still interacting with you. They are compelled by you. They are paying attention to you. This woman can garner attention, the likes of which I have not seen in very many modern figures. And that is why I tell you all, you ignore her at, her, at your own peril. She could very well clinch the nomination, probably not 2024, unless there's such a great reorganization at the top of the ticket. If she wanted it, she could take it. But when the Democrat ticket is open, I think, she, like Kay said, the sooner the better, because she needs to capitalize on the lightning in the bottle she has now. So we'll see what happens in the future. But I, I that is one person that I very much uh, am keeping my eye on, and I keep telling the right, you ignore her at your own peril. And I yield I back. think that, yeah, so I think real quick, uh, Kay, we'll, we'll go to you and then... Uh... We'll go to Rob. Uh, Flicker in the chat wanted to know what you guys thought about Mike Pence running. Uh, I don't think so he has the support. Nope. He is the only guy that, like, okay, like, we've all, most of us have seen the Shawshank Redemption. Mike Pence crawled through a mile of shit and came out clean on the other side. That's the way a lot of America is going to view Mike Pence, and he's going to be a very strong power going forward, whether we like him or not. Okay, go ahead and finish what you were going to say. I was just going to say, I think that the big thing about a potential run for AOC is going to be how progressives respond to Joe Biden being such a vanilla establishment candidate. They had a lot of hopes for him like going into this, especially having Kamala Harris as his running mate. But I don't think that he's going to pan out nearly at where he they thought he was going to be. I don't think that we're going to see a decrim decriminalization of marijuana. We're not going to see any type of Medicare for all in the four years that he's president. And I think that the progressives are going to be not just disenchanted with him, but they're going to be incredibly angry at not just him, but the DNC establishment and Kamala Harris for not doing anything while she was vice president. And so I think that's really going to be something that could potentially propel forward a candidate like AOC that has not just, like, kind of martyred herself on these idea these extremely progressive opinions 
but has made it like her entire personality and not just her personality, but everybody that she surrounds herself with pushes these extremely progressive ideas. Progressives genuinely like her and her squad, quote unquote. And so depending on where they are, as far as like how angry they are at the DNC and the establishment, Democrats in 2024 could really, really push her forward to run in 2024. She may run, but she I don't think she has a chance of winning the primary. I do think she's incredibly talented as a politician. I say that as someone who dislikes almost all of her policies. But unfortunately, we live in a society where being talented as a politician doesn't mean that you have uh, the skills necessary to be a good leader. It means that you're popular. And she is popular with a large section of people. And having that popularity is a built-in voter base. And then all you need to do is be less unpopular than the person you're running against, right? So that that's why that's one of the big reasons Trump was able to win in 2016, because Hillary was so bad, right? So it, there were people middle of the road that probably didn't like Trump, but were like, well, Hillary's just, she's detestable, you know? So if AOC has this built-in voter base, it depends on who she's running against, uh, if she would be able to win a uh, general election because she's already got this huge number of people that are gonna crawl over glass to vote for, just like Trump. And now all you gotta do is be less unpopular with the middle of the country than the other person with a small portion of the middle of the country. However, uh, she suffers from the same thing Bernie Sanders suffers from, and that is they have bad ideas, but they believe them. <laughs> and those bad ideas are not what the establishment Democratic Party wants, right? They'll flirt with it. You remember this? Like one of the one of the most like I thought important political moments of my lifetime occurred in 2016, where you saw a campaign of Bernie supporters and Bernie bros that were doing things like going to politicians' homes at the middle of the night, screaming at them with bullhorns, basically getting aggressive, doing stuff that normally we say, eh, that's outside the realms of polite politics. And they did this over and over, and the mainstream media didn't care, and the Democrats didn't care, and Pelosi didn't care. And then came the DNC convention. And the DNC convention, you remember Sarah Silverman on stage saying, yelling at the Bernie supporters, shut up. You grow up, you know, Bernie supporters were outside the DNC and they're burning American flags and they were threatening to like, oh, we're, we're going to secede from this party, you know, and doing all of this stuff. How quick did they get turned on by the Democrats? How, just like that. They were useful until they weren't and then done. That's that's what happens to Bernie Sanders. And that's what would happen to AOC. And the only the reason the AOC looks so good right now, because her warts are covered up by the fact <laughs> that the people that control the narrative have a vested interest in continuing to allow her to do what she does so that their supporters will go along with them. The moment that that changes, if she would dare to primary Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, the knives would come out. You would turn on CNN every day and they would be bashing AOC. You would turn on, like you'd turn on, you know, I, I don't even, Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel. They would be bashing AOC. Like it would happen. And Same thing happened to that, Trump. That, Look that, how that yeah, turned well, out in and, 2016. Well, that's true, and it, but I just when you make somebody an underdog, you always got to watch it, man. I keep telling people on the right, you ignore her at your own peril. Look, okay, if it was, so, I, I agree with you. Hey, hang on, hang on, Phil. I'm, Phil, I'm not. Phil, I'm not. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. It's a, It's okay. Go. Go ahead, Rob. No, no, I would just say, I'm, Phil, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think that that argument makes sense if it's AOC versus a Republican. I don't think, I think that the left, the, the sad truth is the Democrats are far more capable of squashing any dissent when it matters. They did it to Bernie twice and they'll do it to AOC. Now, if they're a disaster and Republicans win in 2024, then maybe... AOC will be able to say, okay, I'm the preferred candidate. Uh, that could happen. I don't see her having, it would be a political suicide mission for her to primary the sitting president. Uh, I just, I don't, it's very rare anyways to have someone primary a president from their own party. And I just don't think, I don't think that she would do it. I think that even progressives would be like, dude, if you split the party, Right, like you were going to end up with someone terrible, like and then insert Ivanka Trump or you know Ron DeSantis. So I just maybe I I do agree she's very talented, and we'll see how she positions herself in the future. I don't see it happening in twenty twenty four at all. Yeah, redneck, go ahead, and then we'll go to Phil. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't downplay AOC. Do I think she's the smartest tool in the shed? No. Nobody is. Do I think that she's popular? Yeah, damn right. Do I think she's powerful? Yeah, damn right. Do I, I think she has leverage? Yeah, damn right. Who else could talk shit about Nancy Pelosi to her face and get away with it? 
Sure, Nancy Pelosi put a muzzle on her. Sure, Nancy Pelosi took the rod and whooped her ass with it. Sure. We all know this. We watched it happen. But guess what? I kn- Maybe some of y'all don't know a little bit of culture, but I'm, I'm going to culture you for a second. I have never seen an Hispanic, Mexican, Latin, whatever you want to refer to, woman not come back scorn after bullshit what Nancy Pelosi did to AOC and the squad. Period. You can think that the Democratic Party is solid and that they are able to control the cons- the, the dissent. It's all blase blah right now, or blase blah right now, because realistically, Bernie Sanders and his squad, because it is Bernie, Bernie's unk, and then it's the squad, and they're all like Uncle Bernie. He'll help us get through these navigational waters of politics around these these lifetimers on the Democratic side. Nancy Pelosi, I mean, um, AOC has plenty of opportunity to continue her role, if not taking over where Nancy Pelosi leaves off. I, I mean, I know it may sound crazy, but she is the type of person that could be the Nancy Pelosi that we're looking at in the next 10 years she, and then sitting in that position for the Democratic side for 30, 40, 50 years. You guys don't really, I mean, you're right. She's young, very young for the political world, but so was Nancy Pelosi when she came in. So was Chuck Schumer. So was Joe effing Biden. Uh, Wait now, a minute. Like, you're telling me Nancy Pelosi used to be young? I don't know if I believe that. No, I, I lied. I, you're right. <laughs> Nor, you got me. Damn it. Lie, you're right. My, my, my. That, that, wow. Uh, let's not be spreading and, 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 and let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. She's attractive. She's young. That, the celebrity, the celebrity behind it all, relatable, worked at a bar, is everyday Joe. Come on, man. It's it's yeah. it's a no-brainer. And any Republican or conservative that takes her for granted, I can mock and joke about her all the time, but she scares the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, and just real quick, I'd just say on her, like, one, you can say what you want about her. You know what she did? She ran and won. She did. Correct. Right? What did I do? I ran and lost. <laughs> so she's, she yeah, did better than me. And look, if you're concerned, and I understand people say, but she's backed by big money here and there. That could all be true. But she saw what she thought was a problem, and she ran and she won. And I wish more Americans would do that. And the other thing is, I don't, like, uh, uh, we're talking about some of the good things about her. L- let me say this. It, it irks me to no end when I see people make fun of AOC supporters. Like, I don't care. You want to make fun of politicians. That's fine. But do you think that you're going to get the people that vote for AOC to agree with you by mocking them? Those people that voted for AOC did so for a good reason. You don't like it if you voted for Trump when people mock you and say, why would you vote for this billionaire? He doesn't care about you. He's terrible. He's sexist, blah, 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 blah. Well, you probably had a good reason for voting for him. Maybe it didn't pan out the way you wanted, but you think you made a good reason. So I just get sick and tired of the AOC jokes and like making fun of her, you know, constituents because you know what? She's laughing all the way to the bank. She's one of the most powerful people in this country. She is. And that should scare us that someone with her, you know, with her, um, you know, I think intelligence and kind of naivety, I guess, would be how I'd put it, um, is one of the most powerful people. But, hey, she – she, I agree with you totally, Phil. She's no one to sneeze at and no one to, like, mock. She's out there doing things. She's very powerful. And, you know, I personally – this might not be a popular opinion, particularly on this panel, but personally, I see – her as a potential let me be careful i see her supporters as potential allies because i think the establishment is so corrupt that i want to join with populist on the left to end this corruption and then we could go back to discussing how terrible their economic plans are but until we have a voice until we end the corruption of the establishment so instead of bashing aoc supporters i say i feel you i don't think aoc is very good here's why but i understand you feel disenfranchised and I'm with you. I also feel disenfranchised. So let's come together and find someone that we could agree on to try to like end this establishment dominance of this two-party system. So I don't know. I, having said that, I have no love for AOC as a person. I think she's a liar. I think she's a terrible person. But she, you know, there are talented things she's done. You know. Now, if, if I may, uh, one thing that I do cover on the Dog and Chicken Show over at Big Buck and Entertainment and occasionally over at KOE Nation on YouTube, definitely like, share, subscribe to that, folks. You know it's the right thing to do. Uh, something that I cover is persuasion and the, the art of persuasion. It's more of an art than it is a science. And the thing that when I saw Donald Trump speaking in 2015, 2016, I was like, wow. This human being is utilizing persuasion at a higher level than I have ever seen in my life. 
And coming up just second behind that is AOC. And now when people say, I don't think she's all that bright, again, underestimate at your own peril because she's one of the most persuasive people I have seen in terms of talking. Like when she does her live streams and such, it's like whether you agree or disagree with the factual basis, she's tremendously persuasive. And so that's something that I would... Uh, Implore you all to keep in mind is that uh, persuasion is actually the force that makes the world go round. You wouldn't think it, but it actually is. So, uh, well, welcome back, Kay. Yeah, I would uh, totally disagree with all of you. Um, I actually think AOC is highly incompetent. Um, I don't think she'll ever see okay. any moderate to high level office, and that's because she doesn't have the support of the aristocratic class. We collectively don't like her. And there's one reason why we don't like her. Y'all keep saying persuasive. What she is is highly manipulative, and it is the single worst characteristic to have mm -hmm. if you're looking for big donors. What's the we difference? We don't like her. Persuasive people but, can get you to accept their opinion on the basis of the facts and the ideologies behind it from a perspective of data. The issue with manipulative people is they'll leverage emotions and psychological tactics to get you to change your opinion by manipulating you. And doing so by pivoting you or pigeonholing you to the points to where they can leverage you from one point to another until they have collectively changed your mind. And we see this often in sales tactics from companies that try to sell us products on a regular basis. And so we see it coming from a mile away, and we almost out the door absolutely hate them. And that's why almost all of her money comes not from big donors but from grassroots movements that collectively donate through super PACs. We collectively hate AOC, and there is no amount of money I would not spend just to burn her campaign to the floor. And there's a lot of people who share the same mentality, and we collectively have an astronomical amount of money, far more than enough to sabotage any major campaign that she would attempt, just like we did with Clinton. And there is no amount of money we won't spend to destroy a person like Clinton because she has the same personality characteristics. She's highly manipulative, and it doesn't matter how many years she spends in Congress or Senate to build up whatever political capital she thinks that she needs. She's never going to get to the point where she can change our minds until she changes who she is, and who she is is what makes her who she is. And because yeah. she can't change that, she'll never be able to move or maneuver into a position where we'll accept her. So, Fallon, and that's why she'll never make it. Fallon, do you not know that – or no, it's not do you not know. Do you not think that uh, that kind of treatment, that kind of – can have like a, a negative feedback that the more you try and take her down, the more it can actually generate support? No, because we can simply spend hundreds of millions to billions of dollars to dig through her entire collective history until we find something that she did that can actually destroy her reputation. Hmm. And there's no amount of money that we won't spend to find that. And, and the that inevitability is that it exists. I think that's and, and, already and, been done, though. Like, uh, that she's been like enemy number one for a while now, and they haven't yes, been it. able to do anything against her. Like, for her, all publicity is good public publicity anybody attacking her is unfair and turning her into more of a victim like it, it is all uh it's all good for her can i interject real quick mm -hmm. can i interject Fowler, what's your what's your failing to remember man she took out the number two behind nancy pelosi not just any democrat she took out the guy that actually was going to be running for one of the top positions in the democratic party because he sat on his laurels thinking ah oh, i got this seat i'm the establishment we can throw as much money as we need to to get rid of this bar crumb, this bar fly. I think he actually referred to her as a bar fly one day. Like, he dismissed her. You're dismissing her. You're thinking they could throw money at her. The establishment themselves didn't want her, and she beat them. I'm oh, I'm telling not you, dismissing her. You need to look at her. who she beat. I'm not dismissing her. I'd say that we would systematically target her entire user base until we've collectively Brother, destroyed her. There's what I'm trying to tell you is the there. Democrats themselves did it. The Democrats themselves did no. it, and they didn't even win. No, they didn't. What they specifically did was is they ignored her. There's a distinctive difference. They ignored her, and they dejected her as if she were never going to be significant. There's a distinctive difference between doing that and systematically building campaigns that rip apart every single day of your life for collectively that of an entire, what, 30, 40-year-old person's life? You've done something wrong somewhere throughout your life, and collectively we can find those. And if we find enough of those, we can make those so loud that you can't ignore them. She could make a sex tape, and it would be make her even more famous. Please tell me something that she could do right now that would hurt her worse than what she's already done. And not to be offensive or derogatory towards women, but, I mean, I'm just being honest. If uh, AOC, if a sex tape came out with AOC, she could probably be fucking president at the next election. Let's That's go, how Rob. society works today. Uh, so I might take somewhere in between this. I actually think Fallon is making some some good opinions here. Uh, 
And that's kind of where I was going with the idea of this. AOC will be successful. She's very talented, uh, but she will be successful as long as the Democratic establishment allows her to be successful. That's the key point. Yeah, she's a tool for them. That's right. That's what she is. She's protected because she's a useful tool. Now, she is talented. Like, she is talented with her persuasion, manipulation, whatever you want to call it. And she definitely has adamant supporters. But that's not enough to usurp the establishment of the Democratic Party. Nowhere near close as far as I'm concerned right now. But, Falinor, what I do want to ask you is, and maybe you can see how this kind of, I think you'll agree with me. If she continues to be as manipulative but comes to heal from the Democratic Party establishment, I think that then she can succeed. And I'll give you an example. Do you think that Kamala Harris shares a lot of those manipulative traits that AOC has? And the only difference is Kamala has used that manipulation and basically went to the establishment Democrats and said, I'll do whatever you say. I'll change positions in it like that. Uh, but she's still that same manipulative, terrible person. I think that's what sets her apart from AOC and why she'll be successful and AOC has been. AOC actually is willing to challenge the establishment Democratic Party and say, no, 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 I'm my own person, where Kamala has a lot of those same characteristics, which she said, I'll do whatever the big establishment Democrats want me to do. I disagree with that, and and here's one major difference between Kamala Harris and AOC, and and not to misgender Clear her, up. but just to give you uh, – Sorry, I, I messed up something there, but um, oh, I just said charisma. That, that's the oh thing charisma, not not yeah. even. She's a yes man. She's she's a by the line yes man, and she Final does hour. what she's told. Yeah, tread lightly when you yeah. start with not to no, no, misgender it, her. No, yeah, it, it's not to misgender her. It's just a, the the saying is she's a yes. The man. contextual. Yeah, she's a contextual, contextual yes man. She does whatever she's told. Okay. She if someone says do X Y Z, she does X Y Z. As uh, from a person from the aristocratic class, if I pay for you to get elected, you're my yes man to some extent. Typically, it's very limited to the very few things that I want, and other collective parties that I work with all have the things that they want. And as long as you're the yes man, you'll be elected simply because we will throw enough money behind you to protect you and burn through whatever obstacles you run into. Like Nancy Pelosi. I'd burn Nancy Pelosi to the ground in a heartbeat if some other liberal on the left said, hey, we'll be your yes man for taxes. We'll torture to the floor, and we'll destroy her career. We'll, we'll put an end to it, and we'll get her censored, and then we'll get her primary. Like, there's no amount of money I won't spend to get rid of Pelosi, especially if I know I can replace her with a yes man. And, and that's just the simple reality of the world that we live in. We don't live, again, in a republic. We don't live in a democracy. We don't live in a plutocracy. We live in an aristocratic republic, and people like myself throw astronomical amounts of money to parties to ensure that things move left or right based on what we want. And the issue with AOC is she's the complete opposite of a yes man. She is a manipulative person who will say that she is a yes man, but we know for a fact she's a weasel. She stabs people in the back the first opportunity that she gets. It's just like Biden. Biden's – he pretends to be a yes man, but really he's manipulative with his own agendas, and he's mostly a war hawk because those are the people who throw him money. And uh, he's a yes man from their perspective, True. but from all the things that he got money from… If you look at the things that he promised within the first 30 days, it went the complete opposite because look where the checks came from, and look who's in his cabinet. And then notice the first thing that you'll see is they're all hedge funds because that's where the majority of his money came from, hedge funds. And and that's the thing is is you can trust a yes man who's collectively been a yes man their entire career like Kamala Harris. You can't trust AOC who stabbed countless people in the back, and that's the issue is I can't trust you. To do the things that I've asked you to do that you've promised me to my face, and I know that for a fact because we've been exposed to people like them for years and years and years and decades. So we know for a fact just looking at you within 10 seconds and the tactics that you use of whether you're just going to be a yes man or whether you're going to try to sell me on something so that I'll write the check and then you'll do something completely different. And that's the biggest issue with AOC is that will never change with her, whereas in with Kamala Harris, she can be controlled. And she is controlled. The only question is by who? And that's the question that people have to look into from our donations to find out. Yeah, and I think that real quick I'll just say to me that's similar. I don't know that I would use the word as manipulative as AOC, but it's similar to what we see with Bernie, right? I think Bernie was not trusted. I think that the establishment Democrats didn't trust Bernie, right? And I think he spent every year since 2016 trying to tell them, oh, no, 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 I'll be a good boy. I'm a yes man. I'll do what you say. And I don't think they bought it. 
I think that the people that write the checks for the establishment Democratic Party were like, no, why take our chances with you when we could have an empty suit like Biden that we could pay? And then Kamala Harris, who I agree with you, I think she's manipulative in her own way. And I think we agree on the point that the difference is she is a yes man, whereas AOC isn't. That's the big difference. So the manipulation is done in a different way, but it's still there. Uh, so to me, it was the ultimate yes man ticket where you have Joe Biden, who's kind of an empty suit and Kamala Harris that. I mean, she's exhibited that she's willing to literally change any of her policies at the flip of a hat. And I think someone like Bernie, to a less degree than I think you're right about AOC, it's even worse. I just think that the people cutting the checks were like, no, he might go off and do his own thing. We don't want that. We want someone that we know we could buy and pay. Uh, and they'll do what we tell them. Well, that's the issue with Bernie is he actually is a yes man. The problem is, is the people who are writing the checks at the time were the Clinton Foundation. And so he had the ultimate worst case scenario for an opponent who is the person who's been collectively writing checks for all the yes men for a long time. And so the issue with Bernie was he was actually a great candidate. He was probably one of the first leftists I might have actually have voted with because he is a yes man. But more specifically, he ran up against okay, the ultimate wall panel. of yes men. Holy crap. Like, <laughs> and, and, and that was that was the issue is he ran into the ultimate wall of yes men, and there was just nothing that he could do about it because they had already been allocated for so long as yes men to the Clinton Foundation's money that they've been donating for a very long time to the collective parties. And to, specifically to the left party for sure. And so he, there was no chance in hell that he was going to win, and so they just made him an offer, and he accepted it because he already knew from the get-go he was going to lose. And that's why he has an office right now when you actually look at the, the processes that everything went through is he waited. He didn't detract from the party. He took the yes-man position that he was told to, and then he got his comeuppance and rewards in the 2020, which is what he was told. And it's very clear as day if you look between the lines. Can I? Hey, Tom. Yeah. Can we can we get Kay a pillow and a blanket? <laughs> Mama, you look so tired. Kay, have you been pulling on that vape pen again? You you gotta unmute yourself. You buddy. muted. You know that I I am I am in the process of donating eggs for IV fertilization. I cannot have any substances whatsoever. Mm. I am one hundred percent sober. Thank you. You are donating okay. eggs. I am. So, well done. When you said that, you caught me off guard because I'm actually I raise chickens and I donate my eggs. So you're I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, hold up. She donate eggs. You donate some real ass eggs. I've been yeah. donating them. The Different thing. Different he gets thing. to yeah, continue the, the, with the substances while he donates. Eggs, right. So. I get to continue with the substance, but I commend you for it. But uh, you looked very tired, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I and I just I felt really bad because my chat's even going. Poor Kay is tired. She's got little I ones, am. and you're donating eggs. And <laughs> your am. body's I'm working overtime tired. over there. I'm, I'm okay. running on about four hours of sleep in the last twenty four well, hours. <laughs> I was gonna blame Fallon for being a freaking tool over here talking about he loves yes man fallon you just literally negated I, I i have to go back to brento now brento you're right he did like he what did i say wait no 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 not, not, not brento i'm sorry tom you're right when you earlier asked well wait a second are you going back on what you said earlier man fallon if you say you like yes men then you're completely going against what you said when you started off that we need to get away from the systematic or corporatization decision making of the money follow the money follow the money yet you said you want you would have voted for bernie because he's a yes man Homie, help me understand this big tent, because I love our big tent. I want a big tent for the Republican Party, slash conservatives, slash those of us that are liberal, slash more right-leaning. I just don't know if you're actually in that tent right now with a Bernie quote. I'm just, just checking. Sure. So it's, a, it's an easy uh, piece to answer. So the issue with the chess game is if you're playing against an opponent, they have an equal chance of winning. And it comes down to their capability to perform. However, if you buy off the chess pieces collectively on the board, they have less and less of a chance to compete, and collectively you shift the edge in your favor. You have to have enough yes-men on both sides to be able to get anything actually done. And that's the problem with our system right now is having a two-party system allows you to have the ability to simply throw money at both parties. And it doesn't matter who wins because you still have yes-men on both sides. The issue is in order to actually change that systemically – you have to buy up enough of the chess pieces to be able to maneuver the board to where it becomes a multi-party system, and I don't mean a two-party. Or, or you break the fucking board game, the game, or you yeah, break but, the board. But it's that's still the a game, though. That requires. Yeah, no, no, but, 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 I, mean, I understand there's still a game, you but I don't. Okay, let me let me back up. I, fuck a yes man. 
Yeah. That's exactly what we should be talking about here. As a conservative, that's exactly the opposite of what our beliefs are as a core. Individuality, responsibility for oneself, doing what's right for others. And, and, and that's that's not a yes man mentality. That's a groundbreaking mentality nowadays. Yes men are victims. Yes men believe in victimhood. Yes men believe in just doing what their uppers tell them. And unfortunately, we don't want to address corporatism in both well, the Republican and Democratic side and yes our government are, as a whole. They're not victims. They're mercenaries. They'll do what yeah. they're paid for. Exactly. And that's the thing is you need to be able to have a, an Driven. army of mercenaries to win this fight because that's what it is. It's a fight. And you win wars with mercenaries. I cannot see – I cannot see – if – please, somebody send me a meme of, of Bernie Sanders in a Rambo outfit. <laughs> really? That's what you guys are telling me. You're fucking telling me that your comment is, oh, no, I'm saying these yes men are mercenaries. They'll go out and just kill – Slay. They'll no, you did. You said they had for. lay. They, you were basically implying if you use Bernie Sanders as a yes man, hang on. If you use Bernie Sanders as a yes man, then yes, he took it for the team. He did exactly what his team told him. My problem is, is there's a team. And the only way to break the team is not having yes mans. It's having somebody says, no. It, it's not that anymore. Bernie no, not, I don't uh, accept yes this. Man. So Bernie is just kind of a, a pussy, a little, bit, a little bit of a wuss. Like when it gets down to it, He'll just sort of like, he'll he'll sit through another inauguration, like he'll he'll always That's, do that. So, it's kind of it. I, I like him I, though, I, but it's the truth. I will you say like this. No, I no, no. I, I, oh, I, here's the thing that like I I've kind of prodded a few of my lefty buddies with this over the years. Like, man, lefties, them buddies of mine. If you guys would have nominated Bernie Sanders in 2016. You'd have probably won. I mean, let's be frank. Donald Trump took the freaking Rust Belt, and that would have been the only place Bernie would have even freaking bothered to campaign. Even and these fine car factories that used to be open, but no more because of the billionaires and the billionaires and the blah, 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 blah. and that would have just he would have unfortunately probably swept those states. So he had his moment. It came. It went. It's passed and it's gone now. And so that's just, uh, I, I find that kind of fascinating when we talk about Bernie. And one more thing I wanted to say is uh, something that my father noted when he was watching politics was because when I was young, I was really into Ron Paul. I thought, hey, let's go, fucking Ron Paul. And also, like, he, there's a lot of young folks that were into Ron Paul. And then out of nowhere, there was a lot of young folks that were into Bernie Sanders. And my father had to make the observation, what is it? about you young kids that get you get all jazzed up for some 80-year-old man with 130-year-old economic ideas thinking you're going to save the world. What the fuck? And so, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, kind of coin flip on either side that I've noticed is that the, the young folks in each group have kind of latched on to some interesting intellectuals, but I yield back. Um, I, I just want to say uh, I kind of agree more with Redneck on this in, in this position, right? Um, like, Fallener, I don't disagree strategically with what you're saying. And if you, but the problem is this you have to be in the position to pay the mercenary to benefit from the mercenaries. And the majority of this country isn't. And so, how are we going to get someone to break the system when the wealthiest people that put the most money into the pool to buy these politicians have a vested interest in keeping the two party system? Why would they ever risk? Like, I don't think that you, it, 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 like you and the people you're associated with, even if you're putting large sums of money, you're not going to be able to outspend the massive, it, you know, money that comes from people that have already in a position of power. Like they, why would they risk? They're already, these people are already sitting comfortably. Who's, who's this group of wealthy donors that could compete with them? If it's all about yes men, they'll be able to buy more of them than you. And so to me, the best chance we have of changing this system is to get someone in there that is not a yes man. Now it's tough because you have to find someone who's basically independently wealthy enough that they don't need to be bought and paid for so that they could get pushed through a primary and a general election, but at the same time is willing to actually fight for the American people. That's what people hope Donald Trump was. I just don't see like I don't see how we could trust someone that says, well, as long as whoever's paying them the highest dollar, uh, that's who we need in the system. We just have to make sure we pay them the highest dollar. Because let me tell you, the average American, they don't got that dollar to spend. You're right, but the aristocratic class does, and that's the distinctive I, difference. 
and, and that's the issue is you, people think that the two-party system actually benefits us, and it doesn't, and that's the issue is it used to, but not anymore. And that's the problem is for the, about – I'd say the past five to 15 years, which is correlated to the largest exodus of millionaires and billionaires in the country that's ever been recorded, the oh, two-party system has not been favoring either of us. Look at California, for instance. It had one of the largest concentrations of millionaires and billionaires, and it just experienced the largest capital flight in existence of history. The systems do not benefit us anymore. And that's why we're leaving the countries like Macau. We're leaving for places like the Isle of Man, and that's because we're no longer benefiting here anymore like we used to. And so or it Wisconsin. is in our best interest. <laughs> yeah, it's in our best interest to change the system so that it fits our requirements. And our requirements is what we are looking to invest in to have our best interests protected because collectively… That's why we joined together in the first place. We have no interest in each other outside of that, and that's why we buy on both sides, and we pitch money together, and we collectively form super PACs that form super PACs that form super PACs that throw billions and billions of dollars in elections. Th that's where our money comes from. That's where our money goes, and so that's what we keep investing in. But the issue is is that system hasn't been working for anybody that I know of at least the past can, 10 years. I Tyler, can you though – but wait. You said you like – I'm going to give Bernie this credit here. We do know Bernie is one of the first politicians since the, I think it was the 70s, that received so much in actual personal donations in small cap mounts that totaled a grand number that was larger than the actual, uh, all the other people except for Hillary. You do realize that, right? He raised that money, the, green, the, the actual uh, grassroots process that we all are preaching that we want. That would prevent the yes man because the yes man he's answering to is you. So if, I will give Bernie that. He had that. But where you and me kind of start to separate, that you said I would rather vote for a yes man, is that he abdicated all of that, all of it, to let Hillary go because of who? The bigger yes man? Why? He didn't have to. He had more votes. He had enough money. He decided to because the party told him to. So anybody that wants to take their party over the people, that's the problem. It isn't a matter if we have a two-party system. It doesn't matter about the, the, the system. A two-party system can work, and I've agreed that we should have more of a parliamentary type of system in America uh, with more representation from different factions. But ultimately, it comes down to collectively putting all of them on right or left, and I get it. It makes it simpler. It does. It makes it a lot simpler if we can have this tent of, pop of people that lean more this way and this tent with this people. I just I can't I just I can't buy into this. I can't I am completely against corporatization of our politics and I actually believe it happened w way back. I think we've actually just been living in a BS world where we think our vote matters. I want to see our vote matter and I'm exactly agreeing with Rob. The only way we're going to fix this yes man issue and all these other things is by winning local elections and people serving or trying to serve. The more people that we have participate, the more chances we can placate, I mean, get rid of the placators and make something happen. So then you would be against Bernie Sanders because the top three out of Fuck five yes, donors against Bernie for Sanders. him is I'm against major what he did. corporations. I'm against what he, I'm, They're no, major corporations. His, yeah, his biggest – his, his, his on. top three largest are, are, are the, um, UC Berkeley. They are the city of Take New York, at his, Amazon, Google, okay. and Microsoft. Wrong question. Wrong question. Wrong question. You're comparing apples and oranges. I told you. Look at his total amount of money, right? You're looking at what the top big donors were. I didn't say that. I'm saying look at how much money he raised from in, from the small grassroots, the t the twenty dollars, the ten dollars, all that. Give me that nut. Pre pre um, what do they call that shit? The um, primary pre primary. He he had it. He was leading. He was winning the primaries, not only with money, but also with people supporting him. And he literally just stepped back in 2016. It was like, eh, you're right. Go ahead, Hillary. Because she had yeah. power. Yeah, so what he got in cash donations were grassroots movements, which was about $11 million. He oh, got four, okay. I'm looking at the numbers right now. It's about $11 million. And then what he got from big tech companies and large corporations was about 4.4, and that's in cash donations. However, advertising, um, conversations, backroom deals, 
that's where the real movement happens and things that aren't attributable to actual dollar value basis because they're not cash value donations. That's where the real money is spent because you have to look at it from this perspective. To reach somebody on a social media campaign, you're going to spend between $0.07 cents and $78. And that's not going to be covered by 15 million to reach enough people to be able to win a presidency. You're talking about a one to four billion dollar range, and you're not going to raise a billion dollars in a grassroots movement. And and that's the simple reality. That's going to come from large donors, super PACs, and that money comes from corporations over 90 percent of donation base. And five dollars, it's nice, it's sweet, it's kind, it's nothing. It doesn't even buy a fucking cup of coffee. Like it, it's nothing. Like but again, the the minimum buy on a, that. a tech. Tell is, Walmart that. Tell Walmart the five dollars don't matter. I guarantee I can show you. A, I can show you volume matters a lot more than price. Wait, are you really getting to what he's saying here, Redneck? Are you listening to what he's saying? When he's talking about a five dollar donation. I, I hear what he's saying, but he also said that there was eleven million compared to the four million from the big companies in straight cash. But then he's talking about the ancillaries, which the ancillaries is the yes man, and I don't, I'm trying to avoid that. Right? You're actually bringing in the corporatization that I'm fucking saying we need to get away from. There's which no you reason election should. Fallon, there's no reason an election should cost a billion fucking dollars. There's no reason this is a blood sport in media. Well, there must the be because it does. The, pre the presidency is a blood sport in media. It is specifically a spin campaign, which I is why you, when brother. you look at the cost basis, you have yep. to spend between one and four billion dollars to win. And the and only I way you're you getting that early. money is from corporations. No, I hear you. Man. Fuck it's chess. Fuck chess. Throw the board. I mean, no, I get, like, it. Hey, I get it. I get what you're like, saying. I don't redneck, get it, but, but that's not like, how the world works. Yeah, and but all you're doing reality. is if you get your way, redneck. All you're getting is when you lose the election, you get to sit back on your election. Go, you know what? I win the satisfaction of thinking I was right. <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah. no, no, I'm not. Do, I'm not, I'm not being look, right. look, guys. You, hang on. And I, here, I'm not. I'm not being that redneck. Hang on, 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 hold on, hold on. One Go second. Ahead. Go ahead, Tom. We're gonna let you guys. Uh, <laughs> if you're even on the right panel, I get yelled at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna go to our outros. You guys can give your final takes on this as well. Um, uh, whatever you want to say, you can say whatever you want. Um, I, I think I, I'm still gonna be streaming after this. I think Kay might still be here. Uh, Redneck and Rob, if you guys wanted to stick around, I'd like to talk to you guys possibly about uh, dealing with systemic racism on the right or within the Republican Party if you're interested, but uh, we can deal with that afterwards. Uh, Kay, if you would like to start us off with some outros. You, you got to unmute yourself first. Darn it. So there you go. Uh, overall, I thought this was a really fun conversation. I very much enjoyed it, and I am super thankful for all of you for coming on. Um, I really enjoyed it. All right. And then uh, next up is Phil. Well, folks, as I am known to say around here and any other show I'm on, all that being said, thank you for joining us this evening for the Right Wing Panel here on the Tom Foolery Show. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, follow in whatever way you can on whatever platform you are on to keep up with all of this tomfoolery content. I am the devilishly handsome outlaw himself, your king of extreme, Phil KOE. You can find me over at KOE Nation on YouTube. I also make guest star appearances on Dads Worldwide and also the Dog and Chicken Show for Big Bucket Entertainment. And also be sure to check us out over at the Revolutionary Wrestling Podcast as we give our predictions and then review of Elimination Chamber when it goes down, folks. Definitely be there to check that out. And folks, I am delighted to be here. And uh, Tom, I did send you a link a little earlier to something. If you'd be so kind as to put that into the chat, if I could... Just bring that up here, folks. Um, my uh, dear eight-year-old nephew, uh, little Oliver, is going through a really hard time. He was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, he just went through his first round of chemotherapy yesterday. And, uh, Tom, if you'd be so kind as to link to the GoFundMe to help out my little nephew, uh, Oliver Strong. And all that being said, I hand it off to all you beautiful people. Awesome. Uh, Brento Box. Hey, uh, hey guys, uh, Brent Box. Uh, as many of you may have or may probably haven't noticed, I've been taking a break from podcasts. Uh, but thank you, thanks Tom for the invite tonight. Um, I appreciate that. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was good talking. Uh, Redneck it was good talking. I haven't seen you around for a little while. Um, like we were just saying that last one. I mean, the whole point is just like you're like, well, things shouldn't be that way, and it's like, yeah, but they are, right? I mean, the whole system is based on dealing with things the way they are, not with the way we necessarily want them to be. Um, but uh, but yeah, I guess that's that's my only outro on that. Uh, it was good talking to you guys, and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you guys soon. Awesome, appreciate it, uh, Redneck. Muted. For fuck's oh. sakes, pro streamer on board. God dang it, Kay, you got me jinxed now. I've already screwed this up. Phil, first off, God bless, prayers, and definitely I'll get that link and I'll take care of some stuff on my side. Um, Thank you, sir. Cancer is a motherfucker. Uh, I've lost yes. 14 family members to it in a four-year period. I lost my father God, to it, geez. and uh, yeah, it's 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 not good. My deepest um, I, I didn't make my statement <laughs> like no, knowing what we have. You guys are not, you think I'm not hearing you. We're talking over each other. If you build it, they will come. Just because it's the status quo doesn't mean we still have to. For those of us who served in the military, it's called adapt or, or uh, lead follower, get the fuck out of the way, adapt and overcome. That's where we're at in our society today. We had an election that happened. That election, in my opinion, was stolen. We can have plenty of debate about why I believe it was stolen, and I can actually show you some of my factual evidence of where I can show you it was stolen. When our own government, and I'm going to give you this one. Here's the one I'm going to give you. When you see an actual SCOTUS of a state not follow the state law and actually acknowledge that the law was broken, but their only recourse is to not count votes, and they choose to still count those votes, yeah, the game is rigged. The system's already in place, so you have to change it and break it, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a party. I'm talking about a conservative right wing, a, a, a Republican party. If the Republicans will stand up and change the whole game, that's what I'm wanting because that's who voted for Trump. I truly believe everybody that voted for Trump wants this fucking game changed. I'm redneck into the queue. Tom, I'll hang around as long as you want me to. No problem. I have nothing else to do besides piss people off. So much love to everybody. And, and, and again, just because I say it's simple, does it mean it's simple? Old Reagan quote. I, I live by it. I try to be as simple as possible. I'm not delusional. I'm not trying to say I, I won the, the moral high ground here by doing, you know, by trying to change the world. I understand money makes the world run. I do. But I think there's more of us that actually want change than there are of them. That's, okay. that's what I think. Um, I may have posted the wrong link in chat. Sorry about that, guys. Um, appreciate it, Redneck. Um, and then we'll go to Rob. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's been great here. I'll just say real quick about this last topic. Uh, Fallon, I, I don't disagree with you. That's the way the system is. Like Redneck, I'm saying that that system needs to change. I, I think you're fundamentally wrong that this system lately has been benefiting people. Sure, they may have fled California, but we see one of the largest transfers of wealth from the working class to the wealthy with all of the COVID restrictions and bailouts that we saw. So I think, and you see the stock market increasing, like corporations and people that are millionaires and billionaires, very happy right now in the United States. The other thing to realize is this, what massive investors want, what businesses want, more than anything is predictability. I don't see why they would intentionally change a system that they know they could buy off the two parties and that they're having a decent amount of success by throwing a monkey wrench in and say, screw it, let's set up a system where we have many, many, many parties. It's not going to happen. And even if it did happen, I'm sorry, I'm not going to rely on the generosity of millionaires and billionaires to buy the political system that they want in hopes that they'll throw me a few crumbs. The reality is, if you're right, that these people are smart enough to buy these mercenaries, they will continue to buy those mercenaries no matter what the system is until we change it. And by them buying the mercenaries, they're going to do what's best for them and not what's best for the average American. That's why I choose to fight against this establishment, even though it is seems inevitable and it might be an uphill battle. The only chance we have is to get this sort of establishment mentality out of there. So that's what I think. I don't see how you could say, trust us, we'll buy the right politicians, create a third or fourth party, and then we'll benefit average Americans as opposed to the wealthy business interest. It won't happen. Now, having said that, uh, that's just what I had to say in the last topic. Um, 
I thought this was a fun panel. I had a great time with it. Uh, Phil, my condolences. Uh, anything I could do to help, let me know. Though I am broke, but uh, other than that, um, prayers. Uh, I, I, I feel is, terrible. Just yeah. prayers is more than I could ever ask for you. A absolutely, absolutely. My my thoughts goes out to anyone that's suffering. Same to you, redneck, uh, that's lost some family members. So, uh, anyone who's suffering with lack of power right now, my thought goes out to you. Um, I, this is why I wanted to do this panel. It, it's because of this. I think on platforms, particularly like Twitch, but also somewhat true on YouTube, that we see that there aren't a lot of voices that are promoted much that are right-wing or conservative voices. And we see that Twitch itself is a platform that's predominantly for left-wing voices. I think a platform like this shows that there are articulate, likable, very intelligent people with good takes that occur on our side and that we should come together as a community to be able to enhance those voices even if we don't agree on anything. I think this was a very productive conversation. There wasn't name calling. There wasn't people you know, screaming at each other. There wasn't a lot of like drama that was going on and that's fantastic. We could have productive conversations where we're disagreeing and it's still very knowledgeable and we all walk away friends. So I hope that we could continue to come together as conservatives and not even just conservatives, people that are willing to listen to people People that have different ideas than the other than the establishment which is being pushed on these platforms which is predominantly left-wing views so um, that's what I try to do with my show and that's why I'm happy to work with other people because I think it's important to know and even this at the end of the day just in the base level I would rather someone listen to a twitch or a YouTube streamer that I disagree with than go to the corporate media for their news so um, yeah I was glad to be a part of this I really enjoyed uh, meeting everyone for the first time and uh, look forward to talking to people again Oh, awesome, my man. channel, by the way, is Normal America with Rob Noor. I'll put it in the chat here if you want. And uh, you can find me on Twitch, DLive, and YouTube. Normal America with Rob Noor. Awesome, man. Thank you. And Fallen Hour. All right. So to, to answer Redneck's piece there, wrapping it up here. A world where we live in where you can't just buy your politicians is a fantastic hill to die on. It's the moral high ground. The unfortunate reality is it's still a hill you die on, and in in the world of the military, it's adapt and overcome, absolutely, but in the world as a whole, it's adapt or die, and you can't do anything if you're dead, and wars are won by people who are alive because it's win or die. That's what war is, and so to address, I guess, um, a, a component of Brinto Box, Redneck, and um, – sorry, the gentleman before me. Sorry, my nicotine's Rob, working a little better. Right. Rob, yeah. So to, to address the next component, when you split the parties, you actually break uh, cost efficacy. When you divide money by two, it has a dramatic impact. When you dr divide money by 200, however, it has a dramatically less weaker impact because it's dramatically less money to go around. And so you actually weaken influence by dividing. And so the old saying for military is divide and conquer. By splitting the parties, you actually dramatically reduce the amount of influence that the aristocratic class has over politicians, and it allows for grassroots fundings to actually be able to compete because otherwise you'll never live in a world where you can compete. The other issue is is that the aristocratic class, people like myself, we're always going to leverage our money because it's the most efficient means that we can because we don't have a lot of time. We dramatically value our time, so we use our dollars to do our talking for us. We don't go out and campaign and hold signs and shake and stand outside the Chick-fil-A and be like, full Biden. No, we pay an army of people to do that for us, and it has a dramatically higher effect because we can leverage money versus time. And, and that's one of the biggest issues here is the fact that when you have a local election, you win those. Elections at the lower level are won. Elections at the highest level are bought, and that's the unfortunate reality, but a reality nonetheless. The local elections, the state elections, they're won. The federal elections, they're all bought and paid for, and the reality is is it's not who bought and paid for them. It's why were they able to buy and pay for them in the first place, and in order to change that, you have to change the rules, and the only way you can change the rules is if you take over the chessboard long enough to be able to put a policy in place like lobbying is now illegal. And that solves the problem dramatically, or it makes it an astronomically more complex, and then people like us, we simply leave, or we just don't participate in the system, or we find some other means to protect ourselves. And, and that's the simple thing. The path of least resistance is the path most pursued, and in the world of politics, that's buying the politician because that's the easiest thing to do. When you change the rules by buying the chessboard, you make it to where you have to choose alternative paths, which actually gives people the power that they need to actually live in a society where the moral high ground isn't the moral high ground. It's just the ground, and that's the world.